uh, fellow councillors, we're ready to to make a start here, um, and we're just going to start the recording now. I welcome everybody to this regeneration and community meeting uh, on Thursday, the eighth of June. Um, it's a great honour for me to be back in the chair again. Uh, I joined chair of RNC in the last mandate. Um, so I'm very privileged and I'd like to thank my party for trusting me with the role. Um, so without further ado, we're just going to move on and we're going to go straight into apologies and we will go to the group leader. So the first person to go to is Councillor Tommy Maguire. Gormiogat uh, Victor, thank you, Victor. Agus Ganyeri and Taylor Kilkyon the Blaine, and the best to look for the year ahead. Uh, the only indication I have at this stage of Polly is uh, Councillor Catherine Kelly. Gormiogat Victor, okay, thank good you, Tommy. Thank you. Uh, next, we will go to Councillor Alex Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and best wishes for the year ahead. Uh, keep a firm hand on the tiller, and I know you will. Uh, Robert Irvine apologises. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we will go to Councillor Paul Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Wish you all the best in the year ahead. Thank you. I no apologies from the Democratic Unionist Party. Thank you. Uh, great. Now we'll go to Councillor Mary Gardy. Thank you very much, Chair. And again, with the best of luck in the hot seat. And no apologies from our group tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any of the smaller independent parties? Is there any apologies from any of them? Does anybody know? Okay. Thank you. We'll move on. Uh, item number two to sign the minutes and confidential minutes of the previous meeting uh, held on the, the 11th of May 21. That has already been done. And now we'll move on to item number three, uh, which is declarations of interest. The first person I'll go to is Councillor Mary Gardy. Thanks, Chair. Just 6.1 grand day for myself. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, best wishes for the year ahead for you. Uh, declarations of interest for myself uh, 6.1 Grant Aid Panel, 6.5 Peace 4, 6.7 Gorton Glen Steering Group, and 6.9 the Community Planning Strategic Partnership Board. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, next up is Councillor uh, Howard Thornton. Uh, thank you, Chair. A uh, 6.1 granted a uh, as I'm on the appeals panel. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, 6.1, the grant aid has been on the appeals panel also. Uh, 6.7, Gordon Glen Steering Group. 6.8 Broadband Working Group, 6.9 Community Plan and Strategic Partnership Board, and 9.1 as a member of Greencastle St. Patrick's, who are one of the, the clubs that received uh, COVID support through that. So that's the last okay, chair. Thank you. you. Next, we have Councillor Bert Wilson. Chair, yes, uh, 6.1 Grant the Aid Panel, uh, 6.7 Gordon Glen Steering Group, and I think that's it, uh, Chair. And Thank I you. Wish, I wish you well for a, a speedy night. Thank you. Next, we have Councillor Paul Robinson. 6.5, please four. Okay. Councillor John Coyle. Thanks, Chair, and good luck in your year. Um, I just have a declaration of interest in 6.1 as a member of the appeals uh, panel. Thank you. Okay. We will go next to Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good luck for your year ahead. Uh, just 6.8 Broadband Working Group. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have Councillor Tommy Maguire. Uh, sorry, Victor, it's not a declaration of interest. I just wish to withdraw Catherine's uh, apology. I see she has joined us. Okay, Please, no problem. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Diana Armstrong. 
Good evening, Chair. I'm wishing you well in the year ahead in your role. I'm sure you'll execute it perfectly. My declarations of interest are 6.5, it's piece four as a member on, the, on that committee, and 6.9, the community strategy uh, partnership, strategic partnership. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Councillor Mark Buchanan. Thank you, Chair, and all the best for yourself as well. Um, you. Declaration of 6.1 um, as a member of um, one of the groups there that received funding, and also 9.1 as well as a member of Curtis Oscar Cox. In that Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have Councillor Eamon Keenan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, six point one member of the Grand Aid panel and six point eight member of the Broadband Working Group. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Glenn Campbell. Yes, Chairman, and best wishes for the year ahead. Uh, just nine point one as a member of Tremor GFC, Chairman. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, nine point one as a member of one of the groups that received funding from Quan Healthy Living Partnership. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Uh, Councillor Keenan, your hands up again. Do you, are you okay? It's down now. Um, okay, that seems to be all the declarations of interest. Um, so, sorry, uh, yes, Councillor Clark. 6.7, the Gordon Glens Group. Okay, no problem. The fact that you have no hand, um, Sean, if you want to speak, just that a shout. Right, okay, thanks. All right. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, as in previous meetings, I'm going to. Sorry, move... Chair. Sorry, Councillor Deacon. Sorry, uh, apologies for coming in, in late, Chair. And I want to congratulate you on your appointment as Chair of this really important committee and to wish you well for the year ahead. And could I declare an interest in 9.1, Chair, uh, as a member of one of the groups receiving support? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deacon. Um, as in previous meetings, uh, I'm going to move item number four, uh, matters arising, uh, to after the um, correspondence. So we're going to go straight now into item number five, which is Chief Executive's report. And the first item on the agenda is to consider the report on the call in of the decision taken at the reconvened RNC committee on the 16th of March. So it's over to Alison. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, members will have seen from the report that uh, there's two items appended to members' papers. Firstly, the correspondence relating to the uh, call in request, and then at Appendix 2, the legal opinion which has been provided. And Mr Morgan, um, who is the author of the opinion, is available to deal with queries in relation to it. But in summary, Chair, I received a request uh, that the decision taken at the Regeneration and Community Committee held on the 16th of March regarding the noting of correspondence from the Department of Infrastructure into the proposed abandonment of the section of the Croc and Boy Road. Um, that call in was re received initially under 411B and expanded then to include 411A. The key issues are summarised and the legal opinion concludes that the call in does not have merit as specified by section 411B of the 2014 Local Government Act and the details of the opinion um, are, are, are summarised within the report. But as members will have seen, Chair, it, there is a requirement now as detailed at paragraph 25 for the council to reconsider the matter by way of a simple vote. And that would be on a simple, not a qualified majority. So um, you, you may well have comments on the opinion, Chair, but once that is then concluded, the council will now have to retake the vote in relation to whether the correspondence relating to the proposed abandonment, uh, it was noted and that vote should be taken again. Okay, thank you for that, Chief Executive. Uh, I'm not going to get into a big debate over this. Uh, we've had the um, we've had the legal opinion, and um, I will take uh, we'll go to a vote. Uh, but first, I'll let in Councillor McAleer. Yeah, Chair. Like I have a number of issues with this. I suppose first off, the the length of time that it's taken to come back with this judgment, given that the the deadline for submissions was the 30th of April. And um, so even if the, the call-in had have been in favour, 
we're well outside that particular deadline time. I'm just wondering in, in terms of reference and for for a point of clarification, the need for the need for these specifics in terms of a 411B uh, calling, the instructions that I suppose weren't widely available before. And is it, is it the case that we must seek a barrister on every 11B uh, call-in? And what if the call-in request is accompanied by legal opinion beforehand? I think I'm I, I'm disappointed on two fronts, I suppose. The first thing being that that one of those who had submitted their name as part of calling in the original decision subsequently withdrew their name from the list. But more so, I'm, I'm disappointed, I suppose, that the, the judgment passed really is on the decision to note as opposed to the actual impact of the decision to abandon or the decision to not abandon the road that the FA were were judging to make and that the judgment call was made on. And that's that's really on a number of reasons, but mainly because the DFA note to abandon the road was incomplete. It didn't give the full detail of what was called on a note. In the legal judgment, it actually states that the arguments given are more related to the mine and process and plant given the go-ahead as opposed to the abandonment of a road or the decision to note the abandonment of the road. That the the judgment the, or the the note from the FA actually states that if the gold mine and processing plant isn't given the go ahead, the road won't be abandoned. So they're based on each other. The fact that this road is noted as a, an appropriate replacement for the existing road, whilst if the if the new road is or if the road is abandoned, a new road is brought in there, it's going to be around a seventeen story high, fifty three meter high, toxic waste dump in no way can be regarded as an, a suitable or a realistic alternative or a realist, uh, a suitable alternative. And yet none of that is noted in the DFA proposal. The fact is for a larger area of ground as opposed to the 2016, you know, the two applications are very different. I proposed on the night and I'm proposing again that we contact DFA and object strongly to this, given the information that we have now, which we didn't have in 2016, and given the information that they have failed to supply in relation to this, I can don't I, think can I just interrupt to... you, uh, Councillor McAleer? Your 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 three minutes is up. But it's my understanding tonight that we're not here to discuss the merits of this. We're purposely here to discuss the the call in. And as the chief executive has um, told us, um, I think we should. I see one, two, three more speakers uh, after this. I don't think, I, I'm not going to allow a debate to rise over this tonight. We're here purely for the call-in, and I think what we need to do, we just need to go directly to the vote, and we will uh, take the vote, and we will move on, because there's no point. The DFA, the, the council's stance on this is the same as it was back in uh, 2016, and I appreciate what you're saying, that there might be changes or whatever, but the council uh, made, their, made their feelings known at that stage. So we're going to move on to the vote, and I, I'm not going to, going to take any more uh, more um, people speaking on it. So if you could all lower your hands, please. Chair, Chair could I request that you do let other people speak please, on it? Please, Councillor McAleer, Councillor McAleer, Councillor McAleer, Councillor McAleer, I don't have an interest. I made a proposal on the night, as all councillors do. Yes, Chair, to I Councillor no McAleer, I'm going to silence you. On. If you don't stop, I'm going to silence you. Now, you'll be warned, you're not going to step out of line on this committee. Chair, I've seen I'm not Right, that's you silence. Uh, that's you silence, silence damn it. Chair, you're not, and, I'm not stepping out of line. You're stepping out of line now. I said we're going to move on to the vote. It's the chairs. Uh, it's you my there's choice. There's a proposal in uh, second on the table there. Right, we're going to move on to the vote. Uh, and we are going to uh, take the vote. Um, what I will do is... We'll do a roll call just for the vote, will we? Yes, well, Chair, that's obviously at, at your discretion, but maybe just to clarify on, on one matter be before we do. Um, and Councillor McAleer just had, had referred to it. The, the matter that has been called in is the decision, and the decision is to note. So what members are voting on now is the decision to note the correspondence in relation to the DFI uh, proposed ab abandonment of the section of the road in question. So we are required, as detailed in the opinion, 
for, th for that matter to, to be reconsidered or retaken this evening, Chair. And just to advise in relation to the, the queries, yes, uh, 411B requires a legal opinion, and that typically is a council opinion which has to be furnished. Um, in terms of the, the uh, delay, as Councillor McAleer has described it, uh, Council was instructed and the opinion has been uh, brought to members at the first, uh, as soon as it became available to us. But just to clarify, once it is a 411B call in, um, then that must be accompanied by an appropriate legal opinion. Thank you for that, Chief Executive. Uh, Councillor McAleer, can you um, highlight what your proposal was again? No, we're going. No, we're going, we're going straight to the vote. I've been told, and um, we're going straight to the vote. So I'm going to do it by means of uh, just uh, calling out the names and um, tell me how you're voting. Uh, Councillor Diane Diana Armstrong. Can I ask for clarification? Chair, what are we voting on this, Chair? Can I ask for clarification, Chair? Um, I'm sorry. I, I, the if we vote not to uh, note uh, this correspondence. What is the consequences for that? Do we then have an opportunity to consider the proposed and seconded proposal for, uh, from Councillor McAleer? Thank you. I'll pass you over to the Chief Executive. Okay, so Chair, there are two separate matters. Um, in relation to the, the noting of the correspondence, um, my understanding is that the consultation on this closed on the 30th of April. So if the Council chooses not to note um, the correspondence, then that in itself concludes the deliberation on the call-in. Then, Chair, at your discretion, you can move to, to other proposals related to this matter. But the first vote must be taken on the decision that was called in, which specifically was to note the correspondence. Okay, thank you, Chief Executive. Could I ask everybody then to, to lower their hands, please? And I, I'm going to do a roll call on the vote. And I am going to start... Yeah. Who's that? Chair, uh, Councillor Thornton, I, I'm looking a wee bit of clarification here. If we're voting for this, is that that we are satisfied with the notation? Or if we're voting for, is that we're voting uh, for the call? And I, I'd like clarification one way or the other. Yeah. What way we're voting, please, if that's okay. possible. Okay, so Chair, a, a four, a yes vote would be to note, to confirm that you are noting the correspondence. A no vote would be that you are not noting the correspondence. You happy enough, Councillor Thornton? That's great. That's clarified. Thank you. Chair, okay. can we get a recorded vote before we start too, please? Okay. Recorded Victor, vote has Victor, been please. Victor, please, Tommy. Sorry. Councillor Maguire, yes. If if I could just ex expand the, uh, the chief executive's advice there, please. If we vote not to note this document, did she indicate that there was an option for further discussion on this issue? Yes, Chair, that would be at your discretion. You could then consider other proposals, but in relation to the call in itself, we have to, if you like, dispose of that decision. So the but uh, so you have to determine whether or not you wish to note. The correspondence firstly and then you can proceed as you wish chair in terms of consideration of other proposals chair it's kevin morgan here may i make a very brief comment please okay kevin um if it assists the members the vote that you're now taking does not relate to any comment on or approval on my opinion my conclusion and my arguments. What you're not voting on is simply a retaking of the original proposal, and that is what the 2014 Local Government Act requires. So it is a retaking of the original proposal, and your vote does not, whether you vote for or against, is not any acknowledgement of or approval of. Uh, the opinion which I have drafted. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I think that is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, can Councillor Corey and Deacon please lower their hands? We're going for a recorded vote. Well, Chair, it's just on a point, a further point of clarification, please. Just okay. Read, just um, an apologies, but uh, if I'm understanding this correctly, um, 
the original proposal was actually just to note the letter, which is just acknowledging a letter existed and we have seen it. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Yeah, you're correct with that, uh, Councillor Curry. Okay, thank you, Gur Margaret, and best of luck. Thank you. Okay. Chair, it was, it was just to declare an interest. I have put it in the chat function, Councillor Dehan. Okay, Councillor Dehan, in, in this item, yes? Yes, in this item, Chair, thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, we're going then to a recorded vote. Um, and the first on the list is Councillor Armstrong, Diana Armstrong. For noting. Councillor Alex Baird. For. Councillor Paul Blake. For noting, Chair. Councillor Mark Buchanan. For. Councillor Glenn Campbell. For. Councillor Sean Clark. Can you hear me, Sean? We'll come back to you. Councillor John Coyle. For. Councillor Siobhan Curry. If ever, for. Councillor Josephine Dehan is expressed an, uh, an interest. So, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Never for. Councillor Sean Donnelly. For. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. For. Councillor Keith Elliott. For. Councillor Deborah Erskine. For. Councillor Anthony Feely. For. Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald. Above or for. Councillor Adam Gannon. For. Councillor Mary Garty. For, Chair. Councillor Seamus Green. For. Councillor Robert Irvine as an apology. Councillor Eamon Keenan. Against. Councillor Catherine Kelly. For Chair. Catherine Pottergan Kelly. For Chair. Councillor Tommy McGuire. If I were for. Councillor Emmett McAleer. Against. Councillor Chris McCaffrey. The high for. Councillor Stephen McCann. For Chair. Councillor John McClory. For. Councillor Barry McElduff. A favour, for. Councillor Gavin McPhillips. For, Chair. Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Against, Chair. Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. For. Councillor Alan Rainey. For. Councillor Paul Robison. For. Councillor Chris Smith. Chris doesn't seem to be here. Uh, Councillor Bernice Swift. Against. Councillor Earl Thompson. For. Councillor Hard Thornton. For. Councillor Victor Warrington. For. And Councillor Bert Wilson. For. Right, one second. Hello. Hello. Sean Clark, yes. For. For, okay. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Okay, that, that vote was 33-4 uh, and 4 uh, against, so that uh, means that the the, no, the the item is noted. Um, we will 
go back to like I think it's fair to say now that the that the consultation has closed, but we'll move back to Councillor McAleer's proposal. Councillor McAleer, are you there? I'm here, yes. We move back. Do you want to make a proposal? Yeah, sorry, I thought I already had done. Now I'm happy enough to do so again. Yeah, um, yeah I, I just want you to repeat it, please, because it was a bit muffled. No problem. So my proposal is that we contact DFA with two aims, really. The first being that we actually put in a, a strong objection to this, uh, stronger than the, the previous large one in 2016, because we have further detail and further information on which to base this judgment. But we also... Uh, would would advise them that they, although they have the, this recorded as a modified amendment to a road abandonment, that it seems to be a new application and it seems to be incomplete because the detail that they have, the scant, very scant detail that they have, and the the majority of information which is missing from their uh, abandonment notice, uh, really doesn't give a full picture with which to respond to that. So really. Under even basic pretense of the the Our House Con Convention, there's there's no information or, or there is a lack of sufficient information for people to make a response to what is actually proposed for the Crock and By Road. So I would like to respond to them on that matter too, Chair. Okay, Councillor Keenan, are you second in that proposal? Yeah, I suppose uh, given the fact that uh, as Emma says, it's a an incomplete uh, abandonment notice. Yeah, I'd second it. Okay, okay, uh, councillors, you've heard the uh, the proposal. Has everybody agreed? No. Okay, chair, can uh, I call it. a recorded vote again if we're going to vote, please? Thank you. Okay, we'll go to a recorded vote and we'll start it all again. So, uh, councillor um, McAleer's proposal uh, uh, that we go back to DFA with a more in-depth uh, response. So I will start again with Councillor Armstrong. Against, Chair. Councillor Baird. Against. Councillor Paul Blake. Against, Victor. Councillor Mark Buchanan. Against. Councillor Glenn Campbell. For. Councillor Sean Clark. Hello. Hello. Victor. Can you hear me? Yes. For. Councillor John Coyle. Against. Councillor Siobhan Curry. Ev Aber, for. Councillor Josephine Deacon requested or expressed an interest. Um, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Ev Aber, for. Councillor Sean Donnelly. For. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. For. Councillor Keith Elliott. Against. Councillor Deborah Erskine. Against. Councillor Anthony Feely. For. Councillor Anne Marie Fitzgerald. Above or for. Councillor Adam Gannon. Against. Councillor Mary Garrity. Against, Chair. Councillor Seamus Green. For. Councillor Robert Irvine is an apology. Councillor Keenan. For. Councillor Catherine Kelly. For. Catherine, uh, Councillor Podrickin Kelly. For. Councillor Tommy Maguire. No, hey, for. Councillor Emmett McAleer. For. Councillor Chris McCaffrey. No, hey, for. Councillor Stephen McCann. For. Councillor John McCloughery. Against. Councillor McElduff. Evolver, for. Councillor Garvin McPhillips. Against. Councillor Donald O'Coffey. For, Chair. Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. For. Councillor Alan Rainey. Against. Okay, Councillor Paul Robinson. Yes. Councillor Chris Smith is not on. Councillor Bernice Swift. For. Councillor Earl Thompson. Against. 
Councillor Howard Thornton. Against. Councillor Victor Warrington against and Councillor Bert Wilson. Against. Right. Okay, that uh, proposal is carried by 20 votes to 17. Um, so that will be now actioned. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to move on to regeneration and planning directed reports. And the first item on that is 6.1 is to consider um, the report on the grant aid recommendations for call two. And it's over to Kim. Thank you, Chair. So this is paper B, and the, the purpose of the report is to request council approval of the recommendations of the grant aid e panel meeting held on the 2nd of June in respect of summer scheme applications and community services project development grant. Uh, we had 19 um, applications received within this grant aid stream and the uh, reported Appendix 1 outlines the recommendations um, and it's recommended that the Council approves the recommendations of the Grant Aid e-panel meeting held on the 2nd of June. Okay, uh, Councillor um, Chris McCaffrey. Gormaga de Cairley, thanks Chair. Yes, I just want to come in on uh, this one. You know, it's great that uh, the grant schemes are, go are going ahead and there are so many um, summer activities happening throughout the district. Um, however, I'm, I'm slightly uh, concerned. I know that a um, number of them have been uh, rejected based on not meeting the criteria. And I'm assuming that has to do with the uh, total number of days that the uh, summer scheme lasts for. Um, I, was just sort of, I was just wondering, um, for the unsuccessful applications, was correspondence issued back to the applicants? Um, you know, could, were they all afforded any opportunity to amend the application, you know, to meet the criteria? Or was it just the simple case of them being turned down at the first hurdle? I would need to check actually with the with the officers, um, councillor, in terms of whether any uh, discussion took place. The the reason for refusal was the grant aid uh, criteria for the program stated that all applicants must provide thirty hours of activity. So that would have been clearly outlined in the guidelines and um, conditions of the grant aid fund. Um, uh, and as I said, would have been an application driven process. So the, the application submitted would, would have not, you would have outlined, you know, that that criteria was not met. Um, yeah, no, that's that's uh, great, Richard Chair. Thanks, Kim, for that. Um, uh, great. As I said, look, there's plenty of positives. Um, in the report there as well, as I say, there's you know great that there's such a range of activities uh, happening. I was just wondering that because I know that um, if if the applications state was stated clearly in the criteria, but if maybe applications were put in that didn't reach the thirty hours, uh, I was just wondering uh, you know if at any stage correspondence was brought back so that they had a chance to amend that. But um, look, you know, given the the explanation, I'd be uh, happy to propose the recommendations. Gormagut. Thank you, Councillor McCaffrey. Uh, Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, likewise, I think that this is going to be enormously positive to see this uh, provision rolled out, and uh, I'm more than happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Chair, yes, I was going to second that as well. But uh, the staff, yes, they, they put a lot of effort into it, and they're very fair, in my opinion. So I'm uh, very uh, quite happy to uh, welcome and, and support the recommendation. Okay, thank you, Councillor Curry. For Margaret Cahirly, and thank you, thanks, Kim. And um, it is very positive. But just building on um, just what my party colleague was saying there, Corey McCaffrey, just in terms of the ones that didn't meet the criteria for whatever reason, um, have we got any or any of our um, support, our community support officers, or any of um, the council officials, maybe going back to those groups when they're clearly. Um, desirous of, of, of doing something positive in their local communities, you know, during the summer, perhaps there might be other 
um, funding streams or other opportunities to them. It just, as and I know Kim fully appreciates this, it can be so difficult for community groups and organisations and keeping volunteers engaged. And um, I just wouldn't like to see anybody put off, you know, and, and so we want to support them. I'm sure you're probably doing that, Kim, but just if you could clarify for a moment. Yes, and uh, we do have DEA based uh, community support officers, so we, we will ensure that there is engagement with, with all of the groups and um, uh, support available to them on an ongoing basis to to help them to submit applications for future rounds um, and to, to discuss their proposals. So we, we certainly will engage with groups within those areas. Okay, thank you for that. We've had a proposal and we've had it seconded. Uh, everybody happy that we move on? Thank you. We'll move on to item 6.2, which is to consider an update report on the business case assessment paper C. Okay, thank you, Chair. And paper C is in relation to the, the business case assessment. And we have five business cases which were assessed in accordance with our options appraisal policy. Uh, the five business cases were firstly the Ardoan Capital Development and uh, an economic appraisal was commissioned from Cogent Management Consultants, which considered a wide range of options uh, at long list. Uh, they were then sifted and a number of options were taken forward to short list um, and following appraisal option three for full refurbishment works with allowance for NZ compliance and accessibility was identified as the preferred option at a cost of 7 million 139 thousand. Uh, and that is recommended for approval. We also have uh, an appraisal in relation to works at Oma Waste Transfer Station at 964,000, uh, which is also recommended for approval. Two business cases for welfare facilities at recycling centres uh, recommended for approval alongside a, uh, a business case for works at Greenhill Cemetery Pathway, Pathway Works. Um, and it's recommended that the council approves the five business cases as outlined in the report. Okay, quite a few hands on this. I'll firstly go to Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I, I neglected to uh, congratulate yourself on uh, uh, your uh, uh, elevation. You've come a long way since you're sitting next to me in the back benches. So uh, <laughs> good luck for the year. And um, I just uh, two two issues I wanted to raise there uh, in relation. The first is the Oma Waste Transfer Station. I see that we're now entering into phase two and phase three, total cost of which is just shy of one million pounds. I note that the uh, costs for phase one were partially met by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm just really wondering what is the uh, essence of those two additional phases and why are they necessary? And is that uh, expenditure um, unavoidable? My second question is in relation to the, um, uh, the proposed uh, refurbishment of uh, the uh, Ardoan Theatre. Now, I wish to really, I'm, I'm a great fan of the Ardoan Theatre. I think it's a fantastic site. And I think that uh, the idea of refurbishing it is certainly something we want to do. I have raised this consistently throughout though, and I'm gonna raise it again. Uh, the figure of seven million pounds uh, plus for a refurbishment of the Ardoan Theatre to me seems uh, excessive and uh, difficult to sustain and understand indeed. We're not getting a new building. Seven million pounds at the time uh, when uh, so much, uh, so many people are struggling. I think it's going to be hard to sustain. So, uh, can we get some uh, further clarification on whether the seven, where the seven million is, and for full breakdown of it? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, we'll... Okay, I'm going to hand over to John at this stage. Um, John's going to give us some information in relation to the Ardoan, uh, firstly. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, in, in relation to the 7.1 million uh, projected ex costs, um, yes, it is very expensive. Members will be aware, I suppose, that the, these costs have actually been revised in a number of times in the last year. Uh, and the, the cost estimates have actually been going up and up because uh, of COVID and because of Brexit. Uh, they have, I have to say, been undertaken by um, professionals by quantity surveyors uh, as to the work that is that is required. There is there will be a full breakdown and certainly uh, that can be provided to members if, if required. But I have to say that this is done by fully by third parties uh, in relation to the cost estimates as, as to what it will cost in order to refurbish it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, 
uh, you happy enough with that, Councillor O'Coffey, that you get that uh, those figures will be coming forth. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Okay, the next up to speak is Councillor Michael Duff. Okay, um, I know that colleagues are going to discuss other aspects of this report. If I could just zone in on uh, page three there, uh, Chair. Um, the fifth part, the reference to Green Hill Cemetery Pathway Works. Can I just welcome that very much? It's something I have been pressing for is for improved access in Green Hill Cemetery for people as uh, to their family graves. And uh, wheelchair users, for example, in some cases have to cross grass, you know, to access uh, family graves. And there's a, a series of issues that uh, have been presented to me by local people. So in turn, I was speaking to the relevant officers within the council and uh, I welcome very much this proposal uh, to improve access uh, by way of these new pathways in the Green Hill Cemetery. But I think just before we embark on, on everything, I'm going to try to get a last minute say or input from uh, one local family who have a particular view on the thing. Maybe their uh, minds can be put at ease when they see the design and layout of what's up ahead. But uh, thank you, Chair. Best wishes in the year ahead. But my welcome in the context of this report is for the Green Hill Cemetery Pathway Works. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, next up is Councillor uh, Paul Blake. Thank you, Chair. And also to wish you all the best in the year ahead, Victor. Uh, can see you in the chair. Uh, could I have, well, if it's not already been done by anyone, is to propose the report in its entirety, but in particular focusing on the Ardoan they are delighted to see this investment it's much needed but also to see it remain in its current beautiful location that it is we're looking over the river Aaron. so thank you chair okay thank you for that uh, next we have councillor siobhan curry i didn't realize it was in so quick um just in relation to the welfare facilities at the recycling centers i'm really pleased um to see these coming forward um, I did propose that um, after visiting them. It feels like a long time ago now that it was in the chair, but um, just really want to welcome that. I'm not sure um, why they're divided into two sections there, maybe just a bit of clarification around that. But I think it is important um, that we're doing this work and, and um, just providing good um, conditions for our staff and our workers to, to be working in for Mugget. Okay, we will move on to Councillor Anthony Feely. Thank you, Chair, and I want to wish also best luck for the year ahead, Victor. And I know you, you do a good job for you on this role before and that last mandate and done a good job. With. No, I'm, I'm coming in on the same vein as, as, as Siobhan then. And I'd like to thank Siobhan, Siobhan that proposed this in the start that this be looked into. And it's the same, the exact same question, Siobhan. Also, I was wondering why. Why is these six was these six recycling centres picked out? Like there's a few not on it, including my own, for to check out and see if we could do a bit of work on it. Anytime I kind of see that and see some missing in the back of my mind, I always wonder why are they not going to do any work on them? I think that maybe it's me being kind of pessimistic, thinking that further down the line uh, further down the line of closure, which I keep harping on about, we don't want to see any more of these closed. So it's just wondering why just to take for instance Garrison Recycling Centre or Bleaks isn't on it. And um, but glad to see that there's going to be work done on them, on them other ones. So just just wondering why what way is it like that and why is some of them on it? Were they all checked out first to see would they need work or was it just them for you? That's just a just quick question for Victor. Thank you. Okay, Chair, I can certainly address those those couple of queries in relation to recycling centres. I suppose we're, we're, um, in terms of the packaging of the works, that's why they have appeared in two different lots. Um, so we firstly have the, the three sites and then we have the second number of sites and indeed we will be bringing further proposals to you. So the investment proposals, Chair, relate to the sites really in their entirety. As members will know, there are a number of sites that already have 
uh, appropriate and adequate welfare facilities. These works relate to uh, regularising and making permanent the welfare facilities at a number of the other locations. So what members will be seeing over the course of the next couple of months will be business cases for, for each of the sites that do not currently have uh, permanent welfare facilities. So, uh, and a number of the sites that both Councillor, well, uh, Councillor Feely mentioned in his comments will be coming forward to you, if not next month, uh, then certainly the following month. In terms of why they've been grouped in this way, it's really in terms of the works that are actually required. Uh, some require more extensive civils works, others are relatively straightforward because of the infrastructure that's already on site here. Okay, um, Councillor, um, Councillor Curry and Councillor Feely is happy enough with that response. We will move on to yeah. Councillor Diana Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, with regard to the Ardoan, um, I'm happy to support option three. And um, I think to put it in context, could I ask um, um, Director Boyle if he would if he could give us the cost of option five and six? Um, moving to the welfare facilities, um, thank you. This was raised by the previous chair um, last year, uh, Councillor Curry. And again, in my in my trips um, as chair, this was further issues were highlighted. And thank the staff for acting on those on behalf of both the chairs. And really, um, on a recent, very recent visit to Newton Butler, um, thanks was expressed by Martin at the site because the repairs had been carried out since Christmas time. Um, but it's good to see that and in support of the, um, the paper. Thank you very much. And if, if you need a second, I'm happy to second it, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, before I pass you over to John, can I uh, ask Colin user number three to identify themselves, please? Yeah, it's myself, it's Chris Smith here. Chris Smith, okay, thank you. Uh, we'll pass over to John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, option five is uh, a new build theater uh, on the existing yeah, site. Uh, that is an estimated cost of 13.4 million. And uh, option six, a new build theater with additional performance space is uh, an estimated cost of 15.2 million. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, move on to Councillor Raymond Keenan. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, it's good to see that um, the Ardo one's going to be kept on the site it's on and be refurbished. But I suppose seven million, and it is going to be a cost to the ratepayer alone because there's no funding. Um, should we have got a breakdown of of, of the costs with such a large large uh, project before we agree it, or sort of question I'd like to ask. Chair, uh, as I as I said to you earlier on in, in response to Councillor Coffey's, we can certainly provide the figures uh, in relation to the breakdown of the, of the 7.1 million. It, it would be normal uh, in relation to the, the well, what would be presented at the meeting that we would present the figures um, in totality. All right. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Councillor Howard Thornton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, it's uh, good to see so many capital projects here, and especially in a uh, local case here, the Ardone. This has been a long-awaited upgrade, and uh, I agree that option three was the correct option. And uh, I'm glad that our finances are such that we can start now to look at the capital programme, and I think this is a very good uh, example of that. So I'm encouraged uh, by what I see. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Seamus Green. Yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, good luck in your year. Um, thank you. Just on uh, the Ardo one, uh, I know I probably was in a minority of uh, uh, 39 against one, but I've been there before. Um, I didn't particularly, uh, wasn't that keen on the Ardo one. Uh, the being refurbished for the simple reason that uh, it isn't the site isn't fit for purpose. Uh, it's a small theatre that can't bring in the bigger acts to Fermanagh that would have actually attracted uh, tourism and uh, all sorts of the bigger events into, into Fermanagh, which I think would have been a boost to the economy if it had been 
built somewhere else in conjunction with the uh, Lakeland Forum, uh, which has to be done as well. And uh, if there had been a proper uh, theatre and uh, uh, Lakeland Forum refurbished as in a water centre and all of that, you actually have a, a state-of-the-art attraction in Fermanagh that people would have come to because we have a lot of wet days here. We have no no proper uh, indoor attractions like that. I think uh, there's going to be uh, maybe 20 million spent on the, on the Lakeland Forum if the two projects had been put together. And uh, I know people say uh, the Ardo one's in a lovely site, but yeah, it's in a lovely site, but it's not in the site fit for purpose. And uh, it will always be in a very where it is. It will always be a very niche market, uh, uh, and it will only cater for a certain amount of people in the in the, the council area. The, the the fact is, I would say if you went out and uh, talked to the first hundred people that you met, I would say ninety six of them has never stepped foot in the Ardo one. So. Um, I, I'm just uh, uh, that was my opinion, but that option was was never properly given us. It was already decided uh, before the options were were given to us. Somebody else had decided on the options, and that was one of them. And it was maybe a wee add on at the end because I complained about it. But anyway, I know I'm I'm in a minority of one here, so I leave it at that. Okay. Uh, next up is Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Good morning, Kylie. Um, I think I neglected to wish you well earlier on when I came in the first time, so just to uh, do that to you now, I know that you will do a good job in your year as uh, chair of this committee. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, um, I was just coming in on a slightly different note in Councillor Rain. I was just coming in to uh, again welcome the improvements to the welfare facilities at the recycling centres, and um, you know, particularly at uh, Canoli. I know how busy that particular site is, um, as it's the only recycling centre, uh, that part of Erin West. And, um, you know, it, it is a long day for staff there and definitely they deserve to have uh, proper and adequate um, facilities. Um, I'll just, well, I'll just leave it there. Fags me and Shin, go Okay, uh, Councillor O'Coffey, you've already been in. Uh, Councillor Deacon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, uh, Chair, I want to welcome this report. And in particular, I uh, want to welcome the uh, improvement works at the OMA Waste Transfer Station at Gortrush. The rollout of phase two and three of this project. Um, it's an expensive upgrade. Uh, the proposed works will cost almost one million pounds. And it's very good to see that phase 1A of the refurbishment has been completed and phase 1B is underway. And I also want to acknowledge the funding of almost £1 million, pounds, which was provided by DERA. And I know that this government department often comes in from, for some criticism in this chamber, but I do want to welcome that contribution and to thank them for uh, their support. Um, the, the recycling of waste is a, a major expenditure for this council. And it's important that we do have uh, a state of the art re recycling facilities. So this is money, I think, which is well spent. And I also want to uh, uh, commend Councillor Curry for her, uh, br her bringing it to the attention of this council, the lack of appropriate welfare facilities at our recycling centres. Uh, and I welcome the fact is underway and thanks for that. Finally, Chair, I want to support Councillor um, uh, Councillor McElduff in his welcoming the upgrades of the path, uh, paths at Greenhill Cemetery, which is much needed. And finally, I do apologise, Chair. Uh, it's been a long day. I'm a bit asleep at the wheel. I need to declare an interest in 6.5 um, as a member of the Peace for Partnership. Thank you, Chair. OK, that's noted. Uh, Councillor Regan, uh, Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. 
I, I would definitely welcome the the development of the R01 and, and especially in terms highlighted of accessibility and the environmental sustainability. But like Councillor Coffey and Councillor Keenan, the indicative mm -hmm. budget of well over seven million without the breakdown for a refurbishment there, I would have a, a few reservations about just signing it off on that straight away. And the other thing was the in terms of phase two and phase three on the in terms of in the 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 Oma uh, waste transfer station. Did we get the? I didn't hear the information on what what was planned there, or is that going to be circulated afterwards? Because again, I wouldn't like to sign off on almost. You're talking over eight million there between the two projects without really having the full detail breakdown of what it is exactly we're paying for. So. I would just be inclined to maybe look over at that. And a final response to Councillor Green, I've spent many a night down in the, the Ardo one. That's a, a beautiful uh, setup down there. I think the last band I went to see down there was the Logues by 2019. So, you know, maybe maybe the faraway, green, the faraway fields often seem greener, Councillor Green. So uh, just uh, I'd be, be mindful of what you do have on your doorstep, I would say. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we'll pass over to Kim to uh, come in on the, your query, Councillor McAleer. Chair, sure, I think there have been a number of reports to committees um, in relation to the proposals for Gord Rush, but we can arrange for uh, a report with full, full details of the breakdown of the, the proposals to be brought to the Environmental Services Committee uh, at the beginning of July. Okay, well, with that information that we are going to get some information uh, back to the ES meeting in July, uh, is everybody happy with the proposal or the recommendations? Okay, we'll move on. Chair, um, can I dissent from that? Okay, we'll move on to item 6.3 which is to consider the report on the review of the options appraisal policy. Thank you, Chair. So this report is um, seeking approval of proposed changes to our option appraisal, well, options appraisal policy, which is attached at Appendix 1. And just to note that um, to comply with the Finance Act and requirements of the Prudential Code, an options appraisal, including an assessment of long-term affordability, is necessary to justify capital investment. Uh, we have reviewed our procurement policy in September 2020 and a number of the revisions which are set out in this options appraisal policy bring it into line with our, our procurement policy. And they also identify a revised threshold for full economic appraisal. Um, we are also aiming to undertake a, a refresh of the associated business case templates. And this is in light of the move by central government into the uh, adoption of the five case model for assessment in terms of better business cases. We have committed to a significant programme of capital investment um, and it's imperative that appraisal is undertaken in a manner which is proportionate to the scale or importance of the objectives and the associated resource consequences. At paragraph 2.3, I have outlined the, uh, the thresholds which are in place in terms of our procurement policy and on the, par on the column to the right, I've outlined the suggested revisions to the options appraisal policy and you will note that we're suggesting an amendment to the business case for expenditure uh, template between 250,000 and 999999 and then an amendment to the threshold for full economic appraisal then for expenditure over one million pounds uh, just to note that the department of finance threshold for full economic appraisal is two million pounds uh, we have updated the business case templates uh, and they will be attached um, to, the, to, the, to the documents as well. And it's recommended that the updated options appraisal policy is approved. Thank you for that, Kim. Uh, first up is Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And can I thank Kim for her report and for all the work that has been put into this to get it to the stage. I'm happy enough to propose the recommendation as listed. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Keenan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's great to see that we're updating the, the appraisals and uh, modernising everything regularly. But just out of that, I, I would like to make a proposal that all appraisals, business cases, uh, have a stipulation that all contracts up for procurement require that, number one, all contractors and subcontractors pay employees the living wage or above. And as a council, 
uh, as we support buy local and stay local. At number two, the companies within the Fermanagh district area um, would get forced preference with regards to uh, the procurement of contracts. Thank you. Chair, if I could just note that that proposal would be specific to the procurement policy, which is not what we're considering at this point. We're considering the options appraisal policy. Um, the procurement policy would be brought to the policy and resources committee, and that might be something that um, the member might wish to raise with our, our director of corporate services and governance. Just with it, yeah, I understand that. But within the, uh, the the appraisal update of the appraisal service uh, so on the, the business cases, um, would it not be relevant to put the stipulation in there? No, um, the options appraisal really is the thresholds for conducting appraisals in terms of business cases or economic appraisals. It, it doesn't specifically relate to procurement documentation or to the requirements of, of procurement for contracts. Uh, that, that would be, we have a separate policy, uh, which is our procurement policy, which relates specifically to that. Uh, and I know that um, this matter has been uh, discussed with the, the Director of Corporate Services and Governance, and she um, will be able to reflect more fully the um, the requirements around the procurement policy. Okay. Well, thank Chair. you. Councillor O'Coffey. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Chair. I, I'm, first of all, I'm very uh, supportive of uh, the, the proposal that Councillor Keenan has brought forward. I'd be happy to second it, but uh, uh, I, I've obviously tried to raise similar proposals around uh, procurement generally. I think we need to see the integration of social and economic uh, policy goals within the procurement process. So things like having a living wage and uh, paying a living wage and also apprenticeships is something I, I think should be uh, worked into our procurement. Uh, in terms of, I wanted to, I, I'm not at all happy, I have to say, with the notion that we are no longer going to conduct an economic appraisal on expenditure for projects of just shy of one million pounds. This is a massive erosion in the uh, economic uh, strategic uh, mechanisms to control expenditure to ensure that we use uh, the limited resources that are to hand in the most uh, expedient manner. And the idea that really we don't need an economic appraisal until we get to uh, one million pounds is uh, startling and it's no no less startling because I have actually uh, on a past occasion requested copies of the business case and we have a thing called a, uh, a, a the exact terminology may escape me it's uh, like a condensed business case which can be as little as two to three pages of which the business case in the last page can be a single paragraph I think we need to have more oversight over uh, expenditure plans, in particular economic appraisal is very important for the simple reason there's uh, uh, optimism bias procedures within that. There's also issues around displacement, duplication of reserve, you know, additionality. These are things that I think we need to bring to bear to uh, decision making every time above 250,000. Uh, expenditure, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are charged with the good uh, use of ratepayers' money here. And I think it's absolutely essential that we have full control and an oversight over that expenditure to make sure that we get best value for the ratepayer and the best out, outturn from the expenditure involved. So I, I'm not happy with this, and I propose that we, we stick with the existing uh, regime. Thank you, Chair. Chair, if I could just note that um, there's no suggestion that we would not be doing appraisal. Um, we will be doing appraisal uh, at all levels. Um, uh, as outlined in page, on page six of the um, policy, the, the revised policy, uh, what we're suggesting is that we apply a, an appro appropriate and proportionate level of appraisal in line with the level of expenditure to be incurred. We um, have reflected on the guidance available from the Department of Finance. We are not proposing to go as far as the Department of Finance thresholds and that they do not do an appraisal an economic appraisal until they reach a two million pounds limit. We're suggesting a one million pound limit. We are updating our templates uh, for all levels of business case, and those templates will reflect the revised guidance, um, which has been adopted by government in relation to better business cases and the five case business model, which is um, extensive and uh, robust. Um, uh, and all of our procedures will be will be subject to our governance and audit processes. Um, so I, I would not 
uh, agree that we're reducing the level the level of oversight. It should also be noted by members that we do not have the um, expertise in house to conduct economic, full economic appraisals. That when we reach the limit, the point at which we need to conduct a full economic appraisal, we um, require consultancy support uh, and um, that there are, are costs associated with a full economic appraisal. So it's therefore very important that we ensure that those costs are only incurred when it's when it's proportionate and appropriate for us to do so. OK, uh, Councillor Blake. Yeah, just a second. The report was a Councillor Thompson that proposed it. So just a second, the chair. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to clarify, um, when uh, two councils, the legacy councils, um, came together, uh, some of us fought long and hard to get this uh, social clause included in it. And at the time, we were told that was as far as we could legally. Now, um, it has been discussed there recently about trying to uh, beef it up more because it uh, it probably had in the teeth that uh, that it should have, and uh, so what Eamon suggests there, I uh, I uh, contend has already been talked about and has already been discussed, and it's it it, it, it is coming before us again. So um, I look forward to that, and if it's not, um, yeah, I uh, would fully support Eamon's proposal. I believe it is already that's already in. Okay, Councillor Green, uh, Councillor McAleer. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just the comment that I, the way I read that report as well, seemed to be there was a change to the the economic appraisals as noted by yeah. Councillor O'Coffey there. So I oh. I picked that up differently too. But in terms of the the noting from uh, Councillor Keenan there, and as noted in the well, in the report that the uh, and Councillor Councillor Clark's in the background there, is it? Yeah, sort of now. Yeah. Not about no. Just in relation to the the review and and what Shimas was talking about there, that the the procurement review was undertaken and agreed in September twenty twenty. We're coming up to the the one year anniversary of that. Um, obviously there, I think it sounds like there are issues that could be tightened up and strengthened in it. Um, I suppose what we're allowed to do maybe is another thing, but. Uh, I would propose that we do look at that at at a common P and R meeting, and um, as as Eamon has suggested there, there's obviously other issues I would be interested in in terms of getting the likes of BDS and that on the agenda. But definitely, I think it's something that we should be looking at uh, to strengthen uh, the social element of that as much as we can. So I'd like to make that as a proposal that we do look at that in a at a common P and R meeting. Chair, thank you. Okay. Bear with me, what the Councillor Swift. I just swiftly second that um, its proposal, Gerard Agat. Okay. Okay. Um, well, we have the recommendations first of all, we have them proposed and seconded. Uh, is everybody happy with those? Yeah. Okay. No. And uh, are you happy uh, that we bring back a report uh, on the proposal of Councillor Keenan and seconded by Councillor Swift? Are you happy that we bring back the report to P and R? Um, yeah. Can I just can I just clarify? I don't have hand functionality when I bring in, so I have to be quite rude. Just no change there. Go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just. I, the one thing I want to make councillors aware of, um, from my memory, this has been discussed before, um, which I think was, was I think was Councillor Keenan's proposal about the um, the living wage thing. And the thing that concerns me, and from what I remember at the last meeting, was that we have no capacity to check, and therefore we put in this we put in this 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 bar against businesses. Um, sort of, or whatever it might be, or, 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 a, or a sort of a preference toward businesses that, that pay the living wage, but have no capacity to actually go away and check that. And therefore, 
what could happen is that you have businesses that say they are, we can't prove that they aren't, and then businesses that aren't but are honest on the um, on the application and say that they aren't being, I suppose, discriminated against would be probably a, a very harsh way of describing it. Just be careful on that one. I think members should be careful on that one, that we don't put in place proposals that we then don't have the teeth or indeed the capacity to then enforce. I think that's actually really dangerous when it comes to procurement. Um, and I would ask officers to, to, to report on that aspect if indeed it does come back. Okay, uh, Councillor Keenan, your hand is up again. Um, I don't really want to get into a debate with this. Uh, the officers who said that they will bring back a report uh, to RNC or P and R, sorry, on this item. Uh, it's obviously going to be July now at this stage. Uh, so, are you happy enough that that report comes back to uh, the July P and R meeting? I'll take that as a yes. Okay. We're going to move on, and the next thing on the agenda is item 6.4, and that is to consider update report on the various local economic development. Thank you, Chair. Paper E uh, outlines a number of matters relating to local economic development. Uh, there's reference to a Global Entrepreneurship Week online business challenge uh, with Young Enterprise, um, and it's a competition which will involve young people from across the district. The second item is the Re Rebel Business School On Demand Free Pilot. Uh, this is an online resource platform, and it's specifically targeting pre-start and early startup support. Um, and, and under 25s, it is aimed to complement the more traditional business support, which is currently available through our, our own council business mentoring programmes. There's reference to the Northern Ireland Digital Transformation Programme, which um, is has been a, a successful application across the 11 councils to invest in IE for councils to deliver a digital transformation program from July 2021 to March 2023, um, aiming to recruit 18 businesses per council area uh, with mentoring, networking and preparation of digital acceleration plans. It will be led and managed by Antrim, Newton, Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council as lead council on behalf of the 11 councils. Um, the programme is 80% match funded and there's a match funding requirement from each council of just over £31,000 uh, with costs per council area split evenly. And then finally, a data variation to contract in relation to the business startup go for it programme. And uh, it's been identified that uh, there is a need for the central delivery team uh, to be engaged beyond the end of the project in March 2023 until 20, September 2023 to conclude and close out the closure of that programme. And um, there's a deed of variation which has been approved by the Lisburn City and Castlereagh Committee and is is we are now seeking council approvement. The cost of that six month extension is £8,350. So the recommendations are that we partner with Young Enterprise NI on the Global Entrepreneurship Business Challenge at a cost of £2,550. We approve participation in the Rebel Business School On Demand free trial. We enter into a cross-council collaborative agreement in respect of the Northern Ireland Digital Transformation Programme and approve match funding requirement of just of £31,109 and that we enter into a deed of variation to the collaboration agreement on the Business Startup Programme at a cost of £8,350 towards the completion and closure costs. Chair. Okay, first up is Councillor McElduff. Yeah, okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to propose the adoption of these recommendations. And uh, in 2 2, I wasn't sure if REBEL was an, a verb or a noun, you know, whether it was rebel or whether it was rebel. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and, uh, but you see 2 3 there, I think there's a real issue here. And um, it's, it's language. And I know it's not our officer's language, you know, that's presented the aims of the program, etc. You know, but try to understand that. You know, two, three, two, one, two, three, like um, to drive digital inclination amongst the target market aligned to an innovation roadmap, to demystify various advanced digital technologies 
through high quality ideation and active experimentation to put in place a digital acceleration plan and to route participating businesses towards more intensive supports in the digital innovation ecosystem. So I find that hard to understand. You know, what exactly does the program do? Um, and I would like sometimes maybe a plain language, almost a translation needed. You know, a good friend of mine one time spent 20 minutes explaining to me and a friend what he did. And both of us said to him at the end of the 20 minutes, we're not sure what you do. <laughs> and he had just spent 20 minutes telling us what he did for a living. And uh, he said, thanks for pointing it out. There must be a communication strategy needed here. And I, I know it's not Kim's fault at all. This is uh, programs uh, emanating from beyond. But I, I find the language is hard yeah. to understand. Thank you, Chair. I think that's a fair point, um, Chair. And I'll ensure that when we're promoting this program that we have materials which uh, express it in a, in a clear, uh, plain English manner. Or, or Thank you, Councillor exactly. Swift. Yeah, Gara Magat Kihirla, and I would like to second uh, all of the recommendations uh, contained within, and fully supportive of everything to do with the young entrepreneurship. It's fantastic, and anything that helps any of that, including our digital programs, has to be commended. And really, for what seems to be a little a small amount that we have to pay, I would like to think that there's going to be massive returns and definitely great investment and um, success arising. And just for clarification for Councillor McIldoff, it's definitely rebel, uh, pronounced rebel. Um, and that's his swanky Tyrone accent, I do believe, with rebel. But uh, definitely up here, it's called rebel. Okay, Councillor you, Councillor. Diana Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I support um, the recommendations. Also, I'm really, really pleased to see um, the in, the entrepreneurship for the under 25s. My question is, um, can we consider? I propose that we consider a follow on from that. That we look at, at what has come from these two initiatives, and um, whether we whether there is follow on work to be done to capture, you know, um, to capture the talent there. It would be a shame to lose that and build that into an annual potentially an annual event, particularly for the four to twenty four to twenty five year olds. Just on the uh, Northern Ireland Digital Transformation Program, I agree with Councillor McElduff. I think plain speak is what we need, you know, um to really cut through all that fancy hat fancy high polluting language. Yeah, I just think a bit of plain speak. I know it's 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 come from from as Barry says yonder, but um yeah if we could all we could relate to it a little bit more clearly if it was plain speak. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. It's a question just in relation to the digital transformation program and the second of those three that business speak that, that Barry had highlighted. In terms of point two, demystifying various advanced digital technologies, I would have a query in relation to that and whether it actually entails any 5G technologies or whether that's something that we would have any information on at this particular time. We don't have specific information, Chair, but if, if, if it's demystifying, it would be about um, explaining what that technology would offer. There's no propo no proposals here about um, any implementation uh, beyond um, any implementation proposals in terms of 5G there's, in the district. There's a, an act of experimentation as the final point on it, so that would be my my concern there, the last of the the phrases that they've used, active experimentation. So just I would I would have a bit of a reservation about that particular one if if that's the case. Just well this it, it's support for individual businesses, so there's no widespread rollout of any digital technology plans in terms of the district. Um chair, there's it it's really about um information and support for individual businesses about what about what's available to them and what they can benefit from uh, i can certainly get more information and share the detail of any further detail that we may have with councillor mcaleer following the meeting okay uh, councillor mccaffrey 
Fair amount of calculate. I wasn't going to come in there, but just uh, it was an interesting discussion at the end. No, I'm fully supportive of uh, the recommendations, and I think it's um, definitely a great achievement. Um, if we can, um, let's say, is one of the things there for the digital transformation program, demystify the advanced uh, digital technologies or tools. Uh, that's something I'm still working on myself as a young counsellor. But uh, I think for any um, businesses or young entrepreneurs or um, SMEs, if you're able to you know, uh, adequately use um, the internet or online or marketing in that way, you know, you're absolutely lethal. And it's um, great encouragement also for the young entrepreneur schemes, the go for it scheme, uh, anything that, you know, helps those with uh, ambition um, get up and get started uh, is, equal, is equally uh, praiseworthy. So uh, fully supportive of, of the uh, of the uh, recommendations. And I think Matt, <laughs> Councillor McIlduff got once he once he read Rebel, I think that was okay, but the rest of it seemed a bit jargony to him. Um, I think it was George Bush who once said um, that the French were unambitious because they didn't have a word for entrepreneur. So I think uh, these languages tend to get a bit confusing. Much more straightforward in Irish, I believe. Garmogat. Okay, we've had the recommendations proposed and seconded. Everybody happy? Okay, we'll move on to item 6.5, uh, which is to consider update report on funded programs paper F. Thank you, Chair. And this report covers two areas. Uh, the firstly, in terms of the Peace for Local Action Plan, um, we did ask, as agreed at the April meeting, for a three month extension to the Peace for program to allow completion of the remaining projects and program evaluation. SEUPB has now confirmed that extension, but has recommended approval of an additional three month extension up to the 31st of December uh, to allow full closure. And in terms of the Biz Mentors project, um, Council will complete activity by the end of December. Uh, it is to note that it's now been identified that there will be an unclaimable budget of just under €97,000 on, on the Biz Mentors project. Um, project spend has been significantly impacted by restrictions to programme delivery as a result of COVID-19 and also due to initial delays in the recruitment of a project officer. Uh, the, pro the position was then filled on a part-time basis uh, with an initial budgetary planning based on a full-time position. Um, so this has resulted in the reduction also in an, in an administration claim. So it's recommended that the Council approves the additional three-month extension to the Peace 4 programme up to the 31st of December and notes the release of 96,973,015 uh, cents in, in respect of the Biz Mentors budget in order for it to be reappropriated within the wider programme. Okay, Councillor Wilcoffey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, this uh, two questions uh, on this uh, first is around the Peace for uh, uh, program. There, I, I I I see that we're getting another three month extension to the end of December of this year, um, and I note that the letter of offer, the formal letter of offer, was received on the twelfth of January, uh, two thousand and eighteen. So. We will be heading close to four years on the completion of this now. I, I know that uh, I've asked previously if there's been any learning as a result of the delays on this, and I don't think that there's any, I haven't received any clarification really around uh, that, but perhaps my question is really, are we confident that this program will be finished by the end of the year uh, 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 on the basis of this? The second issue is more related to the biz mentors, and I could have raised it previously in relation to the um, the business support. The global economy is really changing quite rapidly at the moment, and all the statistics I'm reading is that uh, there's going to be a severe squeeze on uh, like uh, small uh, entrepreneurial business and much more emphasis on corporate uh, style larger business uh, into the future, and that the uh, the entire process is really accelerated dramatically under the uh, impact of COVID and so on. And I'm wondering whether the council has any thoughts on uh, the ramifications of the changing global business environment for uh, uh, our efforts in terms of either employability or in terms of uh, soliciting or supporting investment in those sort of uh, high level uh, growth sectors for the future. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Corey. 
For my bit of Kaylee, yes, just on 2.2 on the Biz Mentors um, project, and, um, and Kim has um, explained it there that the um, the underspend or the unclaimable budget was due to COVID, um, but also initial delays in recruitment of a project officer. So I'm just wondering, did we, was that also impacted by COVID or did we not know um, was that a lack of preparedness, maybe on our part? I'd just like some clarification on that. And then why why did we employ somebody on a part time basis and not on a full time basis? And just uh, we take it that this is um, this money um, is unclaimable. Can we actually put in a request, considering um, that we've been through COVID and the impact that it has had on this program? Can we put a request into the funders that, um, because I take it that um, the reappropriation is going back to the project in general, but can we actually ask that we could spend that money elsewhere? If that's possible, if I needed to propose that, I'll do that, but just I uh, would like to get Kim's thoughts on that first, please, Chair. Okay, in terms uh, of the part time, well, the delay, um, from my understanding, it was it was due to just uh, the recruitment was not successful uh, at the outset um, and it took some months before we, we were successful in recruiting to the post. It, it in terms of the full time basis, the, the extent of delivery really only warranted a part time role. And we couldn't use the funding for any other element of, of support. It had to be someone who worked specifically on that programme and there wasn't really enough activity uh, to warrant a full time post um, members. And in terms of putting in a request to funders to extend, um, this is related to the, the Interreg programme and it's, it's, a, it's an international with partners across Republic of Ireland, Finland, Iceland and Northern Ireland. Um, we can. I can certainly uh, request that officers get us a formal position on that. But my understanding is that that has been explored informally and um, is is not. Uh, it doesn't look likely. But certainly, if, if members wish, we can put the formal question. Yes, chair. If I could just come back in briefly. Okay. Yeah, just Kim, I, I just presume that other, um, you know, Finland, um, the other, the other uh, places that you mentioned there, um, they have probably experienced the same issues, I would imagine. So we could foresee underspend across it. So if we could, I would like to propose that, you know, we, we certainly, I'm sure we can spend that money on this project. Um, just or, or similar, you know, but if we could form yeah. it that, I'd appreciate it. So I'll make that a proposal, please, Chair Grimaldo. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Feely. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll, um, I'll second Council College proposal there as well. If you're looking for a proposal or recommendation, I can I propose it or second as well as nobody else has done. Hopefully, the, these extra lock of months now will, will help. So if you're looking for a proposal or second, I'll Okay, Councillor McAleer. Yes, Chair, thank you. No, I was just in relation to the queries raised by Councillor O'Coffey. I know he's raised them a number of times now, but is there an answer for that? Because I think it would be very interesting just to hear in terms of the, the reasons for the delay prior to the COVID pandemic and also what the lessons that have been learnt to ensure that, that this isn't repeated further down the line. Okay. <laughs> Um, do you want to, before I pass back to Kim, do you want to, uh, the recommendations hasn't been, they've been proposed by Councillor Feely. Do you want to second the recommendations, Councillor McAleer? Uh, no, if I could get the question answered, no, okay. I'm not bothered second them, no, thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I think Councillor Coffey's query related to piece four, um, which, uh, and I'm confident that that will be closed we did ask for an extension to the end of september seupb have offered the the end of december and, and i'm fully confident that we will have closed the program there will be an evaluation of the program so any learning from the program will be identified through that evaluation and will be used to inform future programs uh, there was a query also in relation to employability 
and there there will be a report uh, i'm bringing a report uh, shortly or well uh, this evening one of the reports will reference the uh, proposal for a labor market partnership and as part of that work we will be focusing on those furthest from the labor market and improving our employability offer across across the district and um, we also intend to uh, to, to move towards the development of an inclusive growth plan for the district also, which would look at our wider uh, business support um, and economic development offer, Chair. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, we've had uh, the recommendations proposed. Can I have a seconder for them, please? A second, Chair, for Morgan. Okay, thank you. And we've had uh, a proposal by Councillor Corey, seconded by Councillor Feely, that we write back uh, to uh, the question, can we still have this money? Uh, has everybody agreed with that? Okay, okay, we'll take both proposals as passed, thank you. We'll move on to item 6.6. .6. And that is the urban regeneration gateways update. Okay, thank you, Chair. So this report is updating members in progress of the gateways project and seeking approval of the design concepts as presented and to identify the preferred language option. Um, this includes design, de development and installation of gateway features in Enniskill and OMA and replaces the existing gateway signs um, and installs new features at key routes into both towns to improve the sense of arrival. It also builds on our place brand work, which we've recently completed and forms part of a programme of capital urban improvements funded by DFC and DFI to support town centre recovery and revitalisation. Um, that funding is has been provided and in order to ensure spend and to draw down the funding, the project must be completed by September of this year to comply with deadlines. Um, the designs are as outlined in Appendix 1 and discussions are progressing with the design team regarding some points which were made by members when the, the, these designs were presented previously uh, regarding the inner gateway sign in Enniskillen. Uh, the proposal is that that would be bilingual and we are looking uh, at the design options for that and also looking at the potential inclusion of Ogham on, on that um, piece of artwork. In respect of the orientation of the text on the Enniskillen vert vertical frame, I just want to note that only one of the four locations in Enniskillen is likely to use the vertical layout, um, and that is subject to agreement of, of a new site on the Sligo Road uh, uh, as well. So the, the report outlines the, the features, the locations, and um, the, the issues around uh, preferred language options. So it's recommended that the council approves the high level design concepts for the for the Enniskillen and OMA gateway features, which includes the materials, topography and iconography that we uh, determine the preferred language option for the main gateway features for Enniskillen and OMA, and that we approve the preferred bilingual option for the Enniskillen inner gateway feature at East Bridge Street. Thank you, Chair. OK, uh, Councillor McGuire. I'm going to uh, Carly, uh, thanks for that. And uh, if I could just go straight to proposal, I propose that uh, we approve the design as we've seen them quite a lot lately. And could I, at part two, could I propose that we go for the trilingual option at the entrances to the town? And uh, part three, uh, approve the bilingual option there for its position in East Bridge Street, uh, strategically positioned in the place of the original Inish Gatlin. So I think uh, it has all been agreed by most councillors. So I'm happy to make the proposal. Thank Early. you, Councillor McGuire. Uh, Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, obviously we all agree on the need for entrance signage. Uh, I'm going to raise the issue I raised previously, though, uh, and I think it is something that we need to look at. I, I'm not content really, because this at this stage we're uh, voting on the materials. I note that the signs into Oma and Enniskillen are to have a rust-like uh, appearance. Now, I don't think uh, that uh, we, we, we certainly can do a lot better than that, I suspect. 
Um, I see the cost of these signs is going to be one hundred and sixty thousand pound plus eleven percent, which is one hundred and seventy six thousand pounds for signs, which will be rusty. And I, I think the last is sense we need to give out uh, in terms of the future for Enniskillen and Oma is that you're entering the rust belt. So I think we should really reconsider uh, whether or not we get um, uh, an alternative uh, material. We don't need rusty signs going into Enniskillen or Oma. Thank you, Chair. Okay, before, uh, sorry, I'll go ahead to Councillor McAleer. Yeah, Chair, um, I spoke on the, the signage before and I, I was underwhelmed then. I have to say, marginally less underwhelmed by the Enniskillen signage now, but the, the OMA signs, I would just put on record my apologies to the public that this just really isn't good enough. And as Councillor Coffey rightly says, the, the expense that's been ensued as part of this project I can't defend it, so I'm quite happy to to second his proposal. I think the the rust belt is very apt. Looking at those signage, those signs that we've been presented with tonight, and I think it was Councillor Keenan said before that we could have got a a primary school competition to come up with something better. I'm really not impressed. the The design of the old everything about it is you no. Know, I can't back it myself, so I'm happy to support Councillor Coffey. Okay, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, uh, I welcome Councillor McGuire's proposal for the uh, trilingual signs, as as that would be what I think should be the way ahead. Uh, our problems with the, the vertical sign, uh, it looks a wee bit top heavy with the way that the wording's on it. Also, uh, the dimensions, I'm quite uh, the dimensions they don't seem the, the vertical one doesn't seem tall enough for something and I notice that the, the base is the measurement and I'm wondering if maybe as a design feature could they look into uh, perhaps making the uh, more uh, as they're going more into sort of older architectural features as in uh, stones and things around the county would they consider using the the old Irish foot and the and and then and what's well, not inches of thumb and I think that's you know that the, the the actual signs themselves, not the plinths that they're built on, would be uh, multiples of twenty five, two hundred and fifty mil, uh, which would reflect the old, uh, which is two inches shorter than the um, the imperial foot. Uh, uh, to, to sort of reflect it, that would be a feature, and then people could maybe get their thumbs out and measure to see. How many thumbs are in a foot and things they got? You know, to make them more tactile and make people want to touch them. Again, if they're rusty, would people want to touch them? And, and maybe we we do need to look at the material. Although I know distressed is is in at the moment, but it may not be in the coming years. But I'm happy to support the proposal at this stage. Chair, you're on mute. You're on mute. I think. We have the recommendations proposed and seconded by uh, Councillor McGuire and Councillor McClory. Um, I'll start first of all. Is everybody uh, agreeable with them? No, Chair. No. No. Okay, we'll note those three as dissent. Uh, we then have the proposal by Councillor O'Coffey, seconded by Councillor McAleer. Has everybody agreed with that? Uh, sorry, Chair, could you remind me of the proposal, please? Sorry, I uh, had to be corrected there. Uh, sorry, no, uh, it's basically, it's the opposite of the recommendations. So um, we're just taking the three councillors dissenting from the recommendations and uh, the recommendations are carried. Thank you. Uh, Guru uh, thanks for that clarification, Chair. Okay, next we'll move on to Item 6.7, which is to consider uh, a, an update report on the Gorkin Glen 
uh, steering group. Thank you, Chair. So this report is an update on the meeting of the steering group held on the 13th of May. Uh, the notes are attached to Appendix 1. Um, there are a couple of items here. Um, there was a, a report on an update in relation to the Phase 2 developments. Also, just to note that the Council has been informed that the Mountain Bike Trails and Gorge and Glens of Forest Park have been awarded Trail Centre of the Year uh, by the Mountain Bike Northern Ireland Awards. Um, and uh, that was uh, joint first with Castle Well Forest Park Trails. Um, so just for members information reporting that. Also, um, in terms of uh, phase two, there have been increased costs associated with, with phase two works, particularly around the play park extension, uh, which is aimed at providing additional accessible play equipment. Um, and it was felt that this would be a benefit, particularly as we have invested in the uh, the the toilet provision, accessible toilet provision at the park. Adira has not uh, agreed to increase its overall contribution from 500,000 to 530,000 on condition that the council matches its allocation by the same amount. Uh, we've also submitted an expression of interest to Adira's forest park enhancement scheme, and we've been invited to submit a business case for a further phase of work, uh, initially costed at 500,000 with the potential of between 50 and 85% match funding by Adira. There's no commitment to funding at this point, uh, but no decision will be made by DARE until planning approval has been obtained. So it's proposed that we submit a planning application covering all proposed activity and at risk in June, and that we would bring them further detail back once we could have uh, an outline from DARE in relation to the the their thinking on the on the application. Uh, so it's recommended the council notes the update report on the meeting of the steering group approves an additional contribution of £30,000 from the Council's capital budget, matching the additional contribution of £30,000 from DERA towards the costs of Phase 2, specifically in relation to accessible play equipment at the play park, and agrees that the Council proceeds to submit a planning application at risk in respect of potential Phase 3 works at the park. OK, we'll go first of all to Councillor Wilson. Hey. Yes, Chair. I, well, I think that's what to be welcomed. Uh, the extra funding and uh, the uh, award for the uh, cycle uh, track that uh, has taken place. And uh, I think, uh, yes, very well done to the organisers in that. And uh, I would have uh, uh, proposed that we uh, note the uh, findings of that. And that we, as the planning application as well, uh, does be applied for. And uh, I, I think that, uh, yes, the sooner it's sorted out because we're coming into the summer, if we have a summer. So uh, I, I would note that. Thank you. Are you proposing the three recommendations yes. then, Councillor yes. Wilson? Yes. Okay. Councillor Sean Clark. Chair, I'm just realizing I'm, I've declared an interest. I was probably better to say nothing here. Now, uh, I'm just coming, some things are coming back to my memory. So I think it'd be better to hand on to the next speaker because I have declared an interest. In, so. Yeah, yeah. Councillor uh, Councillor Wilson, uh, it's my understanding that you're on that committee as well. So maybe uh, uh, you want to retract your your um, your proposal and we'll let somebody else come in. Yeah, probably be better. OK, thank you. OK. Um, next up is Councillor Michael Duff. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I'm happy to propose the adoption of the recommendations. And just to make a couple of comments, you know, this is a great success story. Um, and then what comes with success is more challenges. And in relation to the Spare and Rambler, which was addressed at the steering group meeting, I read, um, I think more advertising still is needed yet. Um, for example, um, the timetable of the Spur and Rambler, Rambler needs to be highlighted at the Ulster Bus or TransLink Depot in Oma, for example. It needs to be highlighted there. And I think at the Glen Park Estate, there's a post simply lying there, you know, a bus stop post simply lying on the ground. And... Uh, I think the, the, it's highlighted variously that the bus stops twice daily at the uh, Gorton Glens Forest Park. 
But again, at the Listen Harney Road bus shelter, there's no timetable advertised there. So I think, you know, um, in conversation with TransLink, we need to get that advertising up. And I know there's going to be greater need for this in the future because um, do you see when those uh, giant statues go up at Mullacharn and the Sparren Visitor Centre and Dava Forest, um, this Sparren Rambler is going to go on a whole new meaning and needs greater promotion. And then in relation to the bus shelter that's going to be erected um, as part of this funding package, um, I'm aware that maybe uh, a suggested design is one that is transparent, you know, which gives uh, people a feeling of safety and a, a feeling of visibility, you know, as a clo as, as opposed to an enclosed bus shelter, which doesn't have that transparency or visibility. And finally, um, the private sector, uh, local family have done a, a great job, you know, providing a caravan uh, amenity, uh, motorhome amenity. We remember an informal meeting with Motorhomes Ireland and they wanted more serviced motorhome sites, you know, in the area. And I know that there's a, a, a limited capacity at the Glen Park Estate, which is very impressive, but, you know, privately run and privately managed. Um, is there the identified need for additional caravan uh, space and caravan servicing uh, site and motorhome site uh, in, in the Gordon Glens itself, you know? Those are my questions and, and suggestions, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, before I pass over to Kim, uh, Councillor Buchanan, do you want to second the recommendations? Yes, thank you, Chair. Just very quick to second the recommendations. Very happy to do so. And it's great to see the work going on here at Gorton. We've visited the facility ourselves um, quite often as a family. And it's also lovely to see the accessible play equipment coming through there as well. That's something that we've fought for as well. And it's great to see that coming through there. So um, thanks again and happy to second that. Thank you. OK, Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Well, I want to uh, support the adoption of this uh, report and I feel it is appropriate for me to uh, congratulate all concerned on the mountain uh, bike trail. Uh, earlier uh, this, uh, this afternoon, we did have a meeting with Hospitality NI and NI Tourism Initiative and I uh, made particular comment on the mountain bike trail. It's been a particular success and it is absolutely spectacular, uh, particularly when you view it uh, from higher up uh, uh, the, the, the hills there at the Gorchen Glens. And over the, the periods, the bank holiday weekend and periods of good weather, um, it's very, very busy and the area is thronged and it's really very, very good to see. And also, I want to congratulate and pay tribute to the Beatty family for their development of the Glen Park estate. It's absolutely wonderful uh, to see life being uh, breathed into the former Ulster History Park and uh, lots of people enjoying that facility. So I would congratulate them on that. And uh, I want to support the report. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um... Chair, in terms of Councillor McElduff's queries, yes, we can go back to uh, TransLink and ask them specifically about the advertising of the timetable um, at, at the bus depot. In terms of the bus shelter design, I think there may already be work developed on the design of that um, linking into the Forest Park um, theme. Uh, but I will I will follow up on the detail of that and share it with Councillor McElduff following the meeting. And um, certainly we can keep under review um, the level of demand that there is in the locality in, in respect of, of caravans and motorhomes. I know that officers are specifically looking at the issue of, of motorhomes at the moment, and it's likely to be something we'll be bringing back uh, to members at a later point. OK, thank you for that, Kim. OK, we're going to move on to item agenda item 6.8 and it's an update on the broad working group and this paper i 
Chair, just to note that this is the, the update from the Broadband Working Group meeting held on the 25th of May, and the notes of the meeting are attached as Appendix 1 to this report, and there are a number of actions which were agreed and are outlined um, at paragraph 2.2. Um, so we're seeking endorsement of the actions outlined in the report at, at paragraph 2.2. Okay, Councillor O'Coffey. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just um, page two, uh, there's a reference there to figures provided with the presentation in respect to premises past uh, were incorrect and an updated version uh, would be issued and there's a number of follow-ons there. I'm just wondering whether those uh, statistics could be provided to all the councillors. Uh, they, they, uh, sorry sorry they for interrupting. The, the presentation that's provided is the updated presentation. Chair, we, we, we did receive that uh, following okay. the meeting. So that's so that, following. that is the updated information. Okay, and the second thing really is in relation to uh, the uh, Vodafone page six, um, they, they're stating that they're going to have additional masts within the uh, the district, but did not provide um, detail, length of time or locations. And I think that's very uh, dis uh, disturbing. It, is, is there any indication when we will get that information from Vodafone? Thank you, Chair. No, no indication. Uh, 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 in terms of any time frame, um, they're, this is part of their commercial rollout plans and they're unlikely to share details with us until they're well developed. But we can certainly go back and ask again. Okay, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm happy to propose the recommendations and, and really like to welcome the efforts that have been made by fibers to roll fiber out across the district and again there was an event held this evening a virtual event for residents in Enniskillen to provide an update on project stratum which is honored to be welcomed and can i propose as a set and aside that the council would promote on the website to encourage members of the public to register their interest for project stratum on hyperfastni.com please thank you okay uh Councillor Feely. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll um, second and raise two proposals. That thank you. Okay, Councillor. Okay, uh, you've heard the two proposals, the, the recommendations, and to to advertise the uh, fibres on our council website. Is everybody happy with those proposals? Chair, Chair, sorry, I have just a procedural issue or question here. Sorry, as opposed to an issue, but the last. Item there, two members of the Gordon Glen Steering Group spoke on it, and you advised them where they declared an interest. But I believe Councillor Donnelly is on the Broadband Working Group, so just in terms of making a proposal, I know I declared an interest, but that's uh, obviously it's for the individual councillor. But I just wanted to query that. Thank you. Bear with me a second. Chair, if I could just note that there really is is no issue in in members um, proposing and seconding the the adopting of the report of the minutes. Um, there's no issue unless it's a pecuniary interest. Yes, sorry, Chair. That's what I was just going to come back in and say. I have no no personal gain at all, and I have been involved in the discussions with Fibre, so I'm well informed and to be able to comment on the paper. Thank you. Okay. Same as same as. Okay, no problem. We'll move on to item 6.9, uh, paper J, and that's an update report from Community Planning Strategic Partnership Board. Thank you, Chair. So this report updates on the meeting held on the 27th of May, and the draft minute is attached at um, Appendix 1. Um, uh, to the to this report, there were a number of items stressed, including in terms of reference for steering group to oversee the development of an OMA place shipping plan, an update in a labour market partnership, and a proposed review of community planning governance arrangements. Um, there was correspondence received from the Department for the Communities in terms of a further update in respect of the establishment of local labour market partnerships, and we've now been advised that um, the Council's indicative budget for the first interim year is £542,261.29. Uh, the Department proposes that the interim local labour market partnership comprises the following core organisations. So the local Council would lead and be the Secretariat, uh, Jobs and Benefits Office, Health Trust, Education Authority, Further Education at College and Invest NI or an Enterprise Partner. 
local labour market partnerships will then have capacity to include additional partners to meet the needs or help obtain further local knowledge. Um, that was considered at the meeting and then there were a number of key actions agreed as outlined in paragraph 2.1.5, um, which uh, are presented to the committee tonight for approval. In respect of the labour market partnership, the, the strategic partnership board agreed to proceed to seek appointment of partner representatives from the core organisations and that then consideration is given by the interim labour market partnership to the inclusion of additional local partners, including representatives from key sectors within the local economy, potential growth sectors and also trade union representation. Um, so the recommendations are that the update report is approved together with the decisions outlined in paragraph 2.1.5 that the Council's Oma Town DEA elected representatives are appointed to the steering group in respect of the development of an Oma Place shipping plan alongside the chair of the Community Planning Strategic Partnership Board and that the Council approves the establishment of an interim local labour market partnership for the Fermanagh Noma district subject to receipt of a letter of offer for the 21-22 financial year and that the Council agrees to act as lead partner and provide secretariat for the partnership. Okay, Councillor McElduff. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, again, I'm a member of the planning Community Planning Strategic Partnership Board, so I'll just decline to make a proposal. Um, but a couple of comments. At the meeting, uh, I was supportive of uh, a proposal that Councillor McAleer made uh, regarding you know, the desirability of uh, trade union uh, membership of such a, a forum as has been developed. You know, but again, that's a matter for the incoming uh, organisation in respect of labour market uh, partnership. Um, I would ask him if one of the core objectives of this labour market partnership will be to, for example, to assist training providers and the college um, with identifying uh, training needs and skills needs, um, for example, and to be very specific, you know, this area is uh, full of engineering and engineering potential to Mecca for engineering. But everywhere you go, you see signs up saying fitters and welders and fabricators wanted. And I was contacted by a local firm who also made the point that it's very, very hard to get scaffolders at the minute and that there are job opportunities there. And there's another niche area in there of scaffolding design. And it's very hard to get scaffolding designers that are absolutely needed for health and safety requirements uh, on sites. So is it about or is it partly about matching skills to available uh, opportunities, you know, growth and growth industries? And uh, secondly, in respect of the OMA Place Shape and Steering Group, just welcome that development. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I have to say it's quite shocking to me that we could even have the situation where uh, I, and I'm not a, a member of this committee, uh, uh, where we could be talking about a labour market partnership and not have uh, the involvement of um, representatives of the employer employees. But also, I have to say, having heard the list of the membership, I would think it's absolutely vital that we uh, invite the employers uh, to engage in this. And indeed, uh, the employer led pr training providers, and I don't necessarily mean the uh, further and higher education sector. I mean, specialist uh, training agencies which provide uh craft and uh you know uh trade skills uh to uh, to you know through um, meaningful apprenticeships and so on so i think what we need to see is um a genuine uh, attempt because i do note from the, the 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 correspondence that this these this partnership is meant to not only issue uh, address or improve employability outcomes but also labor market conditions and uh, i don't know how you can possibly hope to increase or improve labor market conditions without collective organization of employees especially in uh, famana and tyrone uh, which are known to be unemployed uh, uh, low uh, pay uh, low value added sectors where workers are uh, quite normally exploited uh, by quite uh, opportunist bosses, and I think that we need to see their voice included in this. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Chris McCaffrey. 
Yep, I would just um, echo what the two previous speakers have said, and in particular my uh, party colleague, Councillor Michael Duff. Um, I'm happy to make the proposals or the recommendations, and I am in full agreement that uh, you know uh, trade unions do need to be given a mean, meaningful voice in in these discussions um, to represent the best interests of the workers in our district. So I'm happy to propose Gormagut. Okay, Councillor Feely. I'll be very brief because it, it always be said by Barry and Chris, and I'm glad that Barry didn't mention Kefla is there. And there's another team of workers I'd like to mention here as well that it's got very scarce and there's not many about. Uh, and one we said for us previously before I became a council block layers and brick layers, roofers, plasters, plumbers, and electricians, all getting very scarce. No young fellas going in for trade now, and most of them's going on for third level education. So I think that that end of the scale should be thought of as well. And people working on construction sites, you know, uh, along with the scaffolds, was what Barry mentioned. I just thought, thought I'd mention that one out of solidarity with, with the old building. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Yes, Chair. Well, uh, as somebody said to me, I know what there's one in time, it's nearly impossible to, uh, for, to get a, if you want to employ somebody to help out on a farm. It's practically impossible. And as somebody said to me, the only person you'll get now is somebody with either no hair or grey hair uh, to uh, assist on a farm. And that seems to be the way it is. So, and it's not that they, uh, as, uh, you know, they'll be getting a decent uh, day or week's pay, whatever they do. But there's nobody, and as far as I can see, that really wants to do manual work. And as uh, Anthony said there, they all seem or they seem to be wanting to go to education, which isn't a bad thing. I'm not running that down, but it used to be that uh, if you wanted somebody, young boys would be queued up in holiday periods and that for to get driving a tractor. That's not the way anymore. Uh, so I, I don't really know what the future is there, but it's uh, very difficult and uh, it, it's uh, for the uh, uh, builders and brickies and all that. I know uh, one guy has waited uh, three months nearly, and uh, they were to come uh, yesterday, I think it was, but uh, they didn't appear at that. So that's what, uh, you know, from the other end of the sector, what the uh, way that has been looked at. Thank you. Okay. We've Uh, okay, we've had that proposed by Councillor McCaffrey. Can I have a seconder for the recommendations, please? Councillor Deacon. Second, Thank you, Councillor Deacon. Uh, everybody happy? Chair, if I could okay, just note, okay. just just note in terms of Councillor uh, Michael Duff's queries that the the aim of the partnership is to improve employability outcomes and, as Councillor Coffey has said, labour market conditions. It will be about matching um, the needs of of employers and the needs of first or um sectors locally with with um with with um local labor labor market and improving those labor market conditions so it will be a partnership approach we have been informed by dfc of of core organizations but that that is is not the full extent of the partnership and the proposal is that the core organizations would get together in the first instance and identify um the, the wider range of partners who are needed to make sure that that a plan can be delivered, and um, that I have no doubt that will include trade union representatives as well. But um, the meeting of the core partners is just a first step in the process. Uh, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on now to item six point ten. Uh, paper K, which is to consider the report of the director of regeneration and planning. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report then uh, provides details on the terms of reference for the study and to the impacts of fracking on the Fermanagh district. It prepares agree asks for agreement to prepare a response to the DFE skill strategy for Northern Ireland. It um, also considers the consultation report uh, findings in respect of the Council's improvement plan for 21-22 and also seeks approval to progress a preparatory site planning and feasibility study in respect of the former Newton Butler PSNI station. Also with the agreement of the chair, um, I, I got permission to add an additional item 
in relation to a request which I've received from OMA Enterprise Company for a letter of support in respect of an application which it is submitting to the UK Leveling Up Fund in respect of its proposal for the Enterprise and Innovation Hub at the former Health Centre site in OMA. Um, the Council did previously agree subject to due diligence uh, to provide funding of uh, £300,000 towards that uh, that proposal. Um, so I'm seeking approval to provide a letter of support for that project subject to due diligence of the proposal, including the in terms of the completion and approval of the appraisal around the project, and also noting that the project costs have increased um, for the overall project uh, to uh, just just over four million pounds, I think, is the is the latest figure in relation to that. Um, so it's it's seeking approval for the submission of a letter of support uh, for Omar Enterprise Company to submit along with their application to the UK Leveling Up Fund uh, for for funding. Um, alongside that, recommending that the council approves the draft terms of reference in respect to the study and to the impacts of fracking on the Fermanagh Noma district agrees to prepare a consultation response in respect to the skills strategy for Northern Ireland, uh, the skills for 10 times economy, for consideration at the July meeting of the committee, approves the findings and recommendations of the consultation report in respect of the performance improvement plan for 21-22. Um, in regard to the performance improvement plan, I just also want to note that under your other correspondence folder, we have today received correspondence from the Department for Communities relating to virtual council meetings and performance improvement. That correspondence is dated the 8th of June. It notes that um, the department is progressing the matter in relation to legislation regarding legislative changes around the virtual meetings and also has provided us now with an extension to the timeline for, for developing our performance improvement plan from the 30th of June to the 30th of September. Um, and the fourth recommendation is that we agree to progress a site planning, uh, site scoping study in respect of the former Newton Butler Payne Sinai station site. Okay, first to speak is Councillor Wilkoffey. Yeah, Chair, there's a huge amount in this report. Um, I, I, I just want to raise proposal on one item and a question on the other. Uh, the item I want to focus on here is the uh, the study on fracking. Um, the terms of reference, uh, which has been provided to councillors, but not to the community, must be remembered. Um, I find it very inadequate. I have to say it, it's it's restricted basically to a desk based ex exercise, really studying um, uh, you know uh, reports and so on, which is all fine and good, but it isn't actually specialised to our area. Um, I think we need to define what uh, public health impacts uh, could be. So we need to be more specific in terms of the areas within uh, public health. Uh, we need to include a public health review, uh, include an impact of an industry known to be dangerous on top of that. So it needs to take shape against the specifics of the health, uh, public health statistics in this area. Uh, and that obviously includes mental health, but also uh, aspects of um, community cohesion and community well-being, and also uh, the issues around good relations. I think a lot of these would fall within the remit of a public health study. Now, they're not explicit, and I think that they need to be. Um, I also would like this not to be specific to fracking, as uh, we need to talk and to be very careful about talking about unconventional oil and gas exploration and extraction, uh, because we do not know the exact nature of form under which fracking will come to us. And there's a lot of technicalities and technical arguments I suspect we may be facing. This is a highly in uh, intensive industry, and I think as such, it can be treated as a co coherent whole. Uh, I do think we need to consider human rights in this. The human rights are not only of um, what's going to happen if this industry comes to our area, but also the human rights associated with climate change. If if we don't get action, we're already seeing flooding events and so on. Um, and again, it all has to be tied to the realities of uh, what we have here in, in this council area. We also need to consider the, 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 the huge potential impacts on our geology, which is quite unique, and to the hill farm raised bog protected habitats that are so uh, permeate our countryside and our lovely uh, council area. 
And finally, I think we need to critique the notion that this is a, a four well wed pa, we, uh, well pad uh, proposal. This is complete ludicrous. That this is what the the uh, department is investigating is four well pads when uh, the statistics we've been given amount to five thousand four hundred wells. Now you can't get those in four well pads if you know anything about the if I, uh, the trans boundary issues are not mentioned in this terms of reference. Uh, and I, I would just have to say I would like to see this come back before the council. The community is not fully engaged on this. I have certainly some uh, responses, but I think there, for example, there are universities in America, United States of America, which are involved in supporting uh, the local community who are trying to protect themselves from fracking. I would like to see their input into the shaping of this uh, as well as as well as local community. So I would like to propose that those are changes are made, but brought back quickly to a subsequent meeting of the council. In regard to the second issue, which is paper K, um, I do note in the um, the consultation two things which I just uh, want to highlight. Uh, one is that there's a, a consideration. Uh, it came through in the consultation for adequate town center parking and also for pedestrianization. And I would like to uh, ask whether these issues which have come through in an independent uh, public consultation will be addressed as part of the Inniskillen uh, town center uh, management plans and so on. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, I'm quite happy to support the, the proposals from Councillor Coffey. I think one of the issues that I was going to raise in relation particularly to the, the fragging document was the, the repeated uh, phrase on shore. And I think it's it's again, as he's rightly said, you're limiting the scope of what we're actually investigating and and really widening the target for what may be acceptable or what may we, we may not have covered the ground for further down the line. So I'm more than happy to to propose or to second the suggestion. In relation to the the 10 by economy strategy, it seems to be very much another one of these going for growth and there's no accounting for or no realization of uh, any kind of sustainable development. Everything seems to be maximize everything and we'll worry about the consequences later so we would have great concerns about that in relation to the the actual the consultation uh, paper key the appendix two there's some very interesting responses on that as councillor coffee has referred to um i would note i suppose particularly there's a number um in relation to the related comments in section c uh on both points four and well, at a couple of point stages and points four actually, um, relating to the protections of the Sparrow's opposition to uh, gold mining, uh, questions over uh, harming harmful farming practices and promoting uh, tourism across the Sparrow's going forward. So, you know, there's a lot of very interesting stuff in there. People are obviously paying attention to in terms of the the no mo may. Uh, Pro program and in terms of our limited grass cutting stuff like that our pollinator plants so there's definitely an interest out there for these things and i think it's very encouraging to see that and again the uh, greater activity for teenagers and again the skate park and bowling alley being mentioned there so um very definitely happy to to second the proposals for councillor O'Coffey there okay uh councillor curry um yeah Excuse me. Just on the um, fracking, um, just on the uh, terms of reference there for the quotation, just on page two, uh, the second to last paragraph, um, I would just be um, thinking that we should include, we outline um, specific tourist attractions there. I think we should add in the Sparrows region too. Um, and just prior to that, we talk about the tourism sector making an important contribution to the local economy. I think we should also outline whether it's in this paragraph or in another paragraph that the agri food sector is important to our economy uh, as well. And um, along with our tourism product is dependent upon um, our outstanding um, natural environment. And also that we do include in there that um, the district includes, um, you know, an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, we have seven Ramsar sites. I think there's further one proposed, if I'm right. Um, and we have 16 or 17 um, special areas of conservation. Um, it, 
in the district as well. And I think it is very important <coughs> um, that we mention those for Margaret particularly. Okay, Councillor Feely. No, yeah, yeah, I'll be brief with um, everything that you thought. No, I was just, if, 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 if Siobhan was making a proposal, I was just going to second it and just take the agree with everything she had. And just make the main thing is that make sure that we never have any fracking in, in our district. So I just wanted to make that comment, not really a question, um, Victor. Okay, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Chair, yes, I want to declare, and I'm just uh, regarding uh, the, the matter that is raised to do with Omer Enterprise Company as a uh, family member is uh, attached to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor O'Reilly. Thank you, Chair. I wish to speak on 2.4.1, the uh, former PSNI station uh, that the Legacy for Manadista Council bought in 2012. First of all, I'd like to thank the director and the chief executive for uh, taking forward uh, my suggestion that we would try to uh, help get this um, site, a shovel ready site for any opportunity that might present for funding in order to develop some business units there. I think Newton Butler is one of the few, if not maybe the only village in Fermanagh that doesn't have some sort of development unit for startup businesses. And I think we have a very secure site in Newton to be able to do that. And I look forward to trying to progress this to a point where we can actually apply for some funding. Bearing in mind, Chair, just, and I'm sure you'll remember, recall yourself that after we, we purchased this, there was a budget of about 200k uh, set aside uh, for a number of years, but due to uh, this not being able to be advanced at the time, we incorporated that back into the overall budget. And I certainly would be asking, Chair, at this stage that we bear in mind that if necessary that we would uh, look favorably on uh, maybe reallocating some money if it was necessary to help a funding package because if we don't take a focus on our villages and in order to help them recover and stimulate some business growth in them they are in desperate trouble and i think the anything that can bring uh, some business create opportunities for people to self help themselves with their business ideas. We have a wonderfully creative uh, and talented amount of citizens out there. If we can give them opportunity chair, uh, I'm sure they'll step up to the mark as they always do. So I look forward to the progression on this project chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you, Chair, and, and uh, first time I spoke tonight, just so just to wish you luck in the year ahead as as Chair. Thank you. Um, first of all, just want to thank staff for working on the, the terms of reference there. It was uh, obviously Councillor Coyle who proposed it and was happy to second it at the time, this potential research. Um, I think it's good. Captures the potentially wide range and impacts of fracking, which we all want to see, uh, which we all want to see covered in this uh, bit of research. I think. Councillor Coffey does make some good points there. Uh, the only thing is, I don't want to see the terms of reference get too specific. It needs to be broad enough to allow whoever's doing the research to capture every and sing uh, every uh, single aspect. So we don't want to miss any aspects of any impacts uh, by being too specific. Uh, and I think there, there was a comment by Councillor McAleer about bringing offshore into it. I don't think offshore is relevant here, whilst. We want to be broad and find the massive range of impacts that will impact our area. It needs to be specific to our area, which in this case is is onshore in this case. Um, happy enough, but I was going to say, uh, Chair, and maybe Kim can answer this, uh, there may be changes made to this. Will this come back to us to see before it's uh, finalised again? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Chair, yes, I can certainly add um, amend terms of reference based on comments this evening. Um, and if members wish to uh, submit any further comments, um, we can arrange to bring it back through committee. I'm just I'm not sure at this point which would be the most uh, relevant. Uh, it wouldn't be 
I suppose at this point until next month now. Okay. Uh, before we'd be able to bring it back. Okay. Uh, are you happy happy enough with that um, so far, uh, Councillor Keenan? Uh, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. With regards to fracking, yeah, fully support what uh, most of the councillors have said there. Um, I, I do think we, we, we do need further elaboration, uh, as Donald has raised a lot of very valid issues. With regards to uh, <clears throat> the PSNA station in uh, Newton Butler, I would fully agree with um, Councillor O'Reilly. Uh, Newton Butler is one of these places that's um, had very little investment in anything, and businesses, sure, a business uh, park would surely help it, but also. I think maybe a community aspect that the, the likes of a youth club, Newton Butler, would probably benefit something to do with the youth in the area. So I do know there's a lot of issues there, and something like that would definitely help if, if that could be considered as well. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was coming in to support Thomas. Uh, in his comment, uh, I know from I've been in the council that Thomas has uh, done a lot of work on a lobbying for uh, the old uh, police station to be turned into a, an enterprise centre. And uh, I would certainly in, in encourage and uh, the council to look favourably on uh, funding. Uh, just on another th uh, slight deviation on that, I would also, and hopefully the, when the Rural uh, Affairs Subcommittee is set up, that um, we uh, maybe would be able to take a look at uh, uh, enterprise centres uh, in villages where there has been none, because um, I do see enterprise centres as a vital uh, uh, facility in every village, uh, anywhere there is them, I see a hive of activity and uh, it's like the chicken and egg which comes first. Um, I believe if, if the facility is provided, people will respond, uh, which they have done in near any village they're in or town, and they're a great uh, source of employment and uh, innovation and enterprise. enterprise uh, <laughs> Sorry, but that word just wouldn't come out. But um, it was uh, it it really helps uh, you know businesses get started up, and uh, I I think that's an idea that maybe when the rural affairs uh, subcommittee is set up, that it uh, is worth a look into. Just to support Tom. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair, uh, and I want to uh, uh, add my voice in supporting uh, the report and all four recommendations, but I want to make comment in particular on recommendation 8.3, uh, which approves the findings of uh, the consultation of our report in respect of our performance improvement plan for 21-22. And I want to refer in particular to uh, our, uh, the improvement objective uh, under C2, which refers to increased participation in council-led health, well-being, and cultural activities. And I think what is interested in, interesting in these suggestions, Chair, is that we should uh, make our activities more inclusive of all age groups, recognising that not everyone uh, might be able to access uh, information or activities online. And also, I would reiterate my support for increased focus on uh, mental health and well-being, and in particular, the needs of certain groups, for example, uh, people with learning disability. And uh, I think that this is a group uh, which is often forgotten about. Um, we are very much aware of those with physical uh, disability and their needs, but learning disability can be uh, forgotten about. So I certainly uh, uh, would support the call to provide uh, enhanced services for people uh, within uh, our community who have a learning disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, no thanks to Kim and all the staff for uh, the terms of reference for the uh, study and the fracking. Um, could I ask Kim 
Would it be worthwhile if I made a proposal for to bring it to the council meeting uh, beginning of July, uh, or if that is acceptable? Uh, Shelley, probably would be difficult to bring it to the council meeting with with the agenda. The the RNC meeting is the same week um, in terms of the the stacking of the meetings in July. So, um, I think we can bring it uh, directly through to RNC, and we we do have council powers. So. Yeah, just, the best uh, avenue. I would like to get this, uh, you know, proceeded as quickly as possible because yes. uh, this is, you know, going to help the council uh, in the future, and we need it. Um, you know, we need the report back as soon as possible so that we have it, uh, you know, in our armory. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Curry. Yes, Gomelishkin. Sorry, Chair, I forgot just a brief point. Um, just on the the um improvement plan, um, Kim, just I just noted that there was a fairly low um response, the fairly no, low number of responses. And just bearing in mind we were talking a wee bit earlier about language and, and things like that. Just might not have been that apparent to people um what it was about um so i just wonder just for future if we just maybe make it a bit clearer in our social media and our in any um promotion of it that we're literally just asking people what are we doing well what are we not doing so well do you agree with the you know just making it a little bit clearer um i don't think it needs a proposal just a point i'd just like to make for Margaret. thank you councillor michael duff Chair, any mention of Goma Enterprise Company, I think I should declare an interest as one of the council nominated, you know, directors. I know others will want to do that as well. So just to declare an interest at the mere mention of any proposal emanating from Goma Enterprise Company. Okay. And secondly, Sorry. secondly, thank you, Chair. Uh, secondly, I would like to commend um, Councillor O'Reilly's vision, which I've heard him speak about on many occasions for a business park enterprise centre in Newton Butler and uh, Councillor Green has made the same point. Um, what I would say is that where there are enterprise centres or business parks in rural areas, uh, they're usually very successful and take up is high. You know, uh, it's not a rural area, but the Strathroy business units are at full capacity. Um, the business park in Carrick Moor, Techno Tyrone Limited, um, particularly well known uh, to myself and Councillor Catherine Kelly. Um, it's uh, very strong as well. I know that Councillor Anne Marie Dunley and Mark Buchanan from a Drumquin point of view will know all about the enterprise units there. But one thing I want to recall is if any lessons can be learned from this. Um, Councillor Rennie will recall this, I think. Um, Fintana. There was an enterprise centre earmarked for Fintna over 10 years ago, around 15 years ago, in fact, and council land was being made available. The Ireland Fund, as I recall, was prepared to back it financially, and there were 12 local tenants waiting to take up the units, and yet there was a planning decision to disallow it, a bad planning decision. One of the worst planning decisions I ever witnessed. Uh, they said it was a finely balanced decision, but they made the wrong call and didn't allow it. And I think a huge amount of potential wasn't realised and fit at that time. And I would like to see, and I know that I have spoken to Councillor Stephen McCann about this, I would like to see the revisiting of that in the Fintan area, um, which deserves a, a lot of attention. So I'll leave it at that, Chair, except to say additionally that I'm waiting an opportunity at a future meeting uh, whichever committee it is, uh, to have this discussion about the potential of remote working hubs, which are a variation of this. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, and finally, Councillor Thompson. Yes, thank you again, Chairman. Uh, I just declared an interest as a Director of Fulman Enterprise Company Limited. I'd also declared an interest in item 7.1, the events uh, as a member of the event strategy working group. Apologies for that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chair, just kind of if I can declare an interest myself on the way to the end, but um it's Chris here um as a member of the uh 
Oh, my enterprise company, please. Okay, thank you, Councillor Smith. Okay, uh, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, cheers, Chair. Yeah, likewise, just to declare an interest, just as a director of Women Enterprise Company, and just to say what I put in the chat regarding uh, uh, my interest, uh, just as a member of one of the groups under the event strategy update. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we've had the uh, the two proposals from uh, Councillor O'Coffey and Councillor uh, Curry, uh, which both have been seconded. Uh, Kim is going to action those. Um, uh, updating the terms of reference. We now need an overall uh, proposal for the recommendations uh, on the paper. Uh, can I have a proposal, please? Councillor Garrity and second to be Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Thank you, everybody happy? Thank you. Okay, we're now moving over on to the Community Health and Leisure Director reports. And the first item is 7.1 to consider the report on events and festivals 21-22, and that is paper L. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the Event Strategy Working Group met on the 26th of May, uh, and the minutes of the meeting are attached at Appendix 1 for, for members. Uh, we had a call of for uh, events and sponsorship, which closed on the 17th of May, and the recommendations are included as, as part of, of this report. Uh, can I please inform members that, that one event, uh, the Enniskillen 100 Revival Motorcycle Race, uh, for which there was a proposal that we would receive £3,000 of sponsorship, has been cancelled by the organisers uh, due to COVID. So that has just come in in the last day or so, uh, that that event is no longer taking place. Uh, the report also deals with, with corporate events um, and, and just in, in relation to Halloween. It is really still uncertain um, as to the res restrictions that are in place with regard to COVID at, at Halloween time and, and restrictions on mass gatherings. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, it was discussed at the event strategy working group that a smaller scale family and, and community events would take place. Um, for Halloween, much the same as last year, uh, where groups would uh, would apply for grant aid uh, uh, to support activities. With, with regard to Christmas, uh, it is proposed that a report would be taken back uh, to the next event strategy working group, uh, when hopefully there will be greater clarity as to the restrictions that will be that would be in place. However, given the time scales, it, it is proposed uh, to tender for the projection of lighting uh, as much as the same as what we've seen last year uh, in Oma and Enniskillen and indeed in the various rural uh, towns and villages that we have. Um, and, and because of timing, it's anticipated or it's proposed that we go out to tender for that uh, at this stage. In relation to St. Patrick's Day in, in 2022, uh, again, uh, it's proposed that we undertake further consultation with, with stakeholders on the event and, and, and bring a, a report back uh, to a, a future future committee. Um, Chair, it's, it's, it's therefore proposed um, that uh, note the minutes of the event strategy working group uh, approves the recommendations for support of the corporate sponsorship um, model for third party events, uh, approves the options for Halloween, for Christmas, uh, and approves the procurement for lighting and projection uh, for Christmas festival of 2021, much in, in line with what happened in 2020. Uh, notes the intention to uh, start discussions and planning for St. Patrick's Day uh, in Enniskillen with Project St. Patrick and uh, also with delivery partners uh, for OMA St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor McCaffrey. Mr. Margaret, entirely, yes, I'm happy to uh, propose the recommendations. Uh, I did just want to come in on one uh, minor issue. It's just something that I would have heard uh, during Christmas time uh, last year, and uh, we all know it's unique uh, circumstances during, given this COVID-19 pandemic. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably a trivial thing, and maybe it's more for, for information if, if maybe John can advise better. But, you know, some of the more uh, the rural villages had... Um, made a, a few comments that they would like to see much more uh, Christmas lighting in place. Um, I was wondering if that's something that we could build on now. I do know that there may have been funding available for community groups to um, perhaps take that on, uh, that project on by themselves. But I was just wondering, maybe John can advise better uh, in terms of groups, you know, getting funding for, for Christmas lighting and Christmas trees, or if there's something that the council can play a more active role in that as well. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to comment on that, Chair? Yeah, Chair, Chair we, we have a, a procedure and policy in relation to Christmas lights and Christmas trees and uh, who can apply for them and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that, that is laid out. Um, and I think nearly all of our rural villages and our rural towns uh, take advantage of, of that. Um, it is, of course, um, uh, you know, bound by, by, by finances. Um, and but um, we do live we do live by by the procedures and, and policies that were, are that are there in relation to the applications which are received. Yeah, uh, good chair. Thanks, for that, John. I'm glad we're not taking the Cromwellian approach and cancelling Christmas altogether. So that's important. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Feely. Yeah, th thank you, chair. I'd be grateful as well. I just my second proposal, and as kind of, I'm glad John did, did mention rural towns when he was talking about the Christmas thing. I'm gonna well, not just last, but Christmas is before that. I just a wee bit, not too bad, a wee bit of negativity, negativity bit where the rural towns wasn't made up as well as in the skilling. And I know it's some of the towns hasn't got as good as community group to get get them sorted out and get all the the rates made and, and doesn't really know the holdings and extra. But I'm glad it's gonna be discussed at the at the next coming up meeting. And it's just it's just um it's funny where we're talking about Christmas already and we haven't got to the long of the year yet, but that's just the way times go. But I'll second it and well well done to everybody involved. But just keep keep the rural towns and then try and get them lit up as well as we can. It just just just, just don't forget about the rural towns. But I know John mentioned then thanks for that and I'm happy to second about the recommendation. Thank you. Uh Councillor Michael Duff. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, glad to see the FLA Fests both mentioned there, both receiving due support. And I know that in mid Tyrone and beyond, people are very enthused uh, about the imminent return of the Mid Ulster Drama Festival. Um, again, Councillor Catherine Kelly and I uh, have a probably a long history of nine nights in a row at the theatre in Carrickmore, visiting the Patrician Hall, Victor. It's something to behold, you know, it really is. And uh, suppose my query would be this, and I would ask Councillor McCaffrey if he would consider incorporating this into his proposal of adoption. Perhaps one um, award could be revisited, and I do absolutely respect the professionalism of the people who did the work and who have produced this matrix, you know, this paper L appendix too. But I'm thinking that the Oma Winter Wonderland, which is going to last. Uh, few weeks. I think it's being underestimated. I think that it is a far bigger uh, potential than is being acknowledged in the award there. Um, I think it has been recategorized as a medium event. I, I have every confidence that it's going to be a large event. And speaking to the organizers, you know, um, I know they're very keen to talk to the town center uh, forum and town center people and the council about how the town centre can be a winner as well. You know, even the possibility of a shuttle bus, um, voucher, uh, promotional scheme, all that kind of thing. I think it's it's probably hard to gauge uh, how successful it's going to be, you know, and I do commend the officers for the way they've engaged so far, but just I think this one might be revisited uh, with a view towards seeing if, or if it doesn't, merit a revision upwards, you know. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want well, Councillor Elliot? Or sorry, hold on. Uh, do you want to answer yeah. that? Yeah, Chair, I suppose in, in, in regards to the, the Winter Wonderland event, uh, the moderation team did treat it as a, as a, as a medium-sized event. Um, 
this is the first time that it has been that it has taken place. Uh, there is no history for the event uh, in in the past, and I know that that the that the team themselves uh, of organisers have have grand plans for it. However, you know, just the same as our own Christmas event, there are uncertainties associated with the COVID restrictions that we're not fully aware of at at this stage. And, and I suppose in in that respect, um, you know, the the the, the team did um, the moderation team did did see it as as a medium sized event rather than than a large event. I I am aware that St Endes uh, GSE GSE have have ambitions for for bringing some major events to their grounds in in future years. And and you know, if, if appropriate, can I, can I suggest that maybe we can uh, get into a conversation with them much earlier uh, stage of the year? in advance of funding with the possibility of, of combining it into into one application maybe um to the to the council uh, so that it can be a, you know the, the whole range of events can be can be assessed as a larger or even or even national event uh, and the subsequent increase in, in funding uh, sponsorship that would, would would come with that uh, with regard to to the, as as it is at the difficult the difficulty at the moment is in relation to the uncertainties that are there i think councillor McIlduff has stated it's hard to know, you know, the success of it, and especially in this year with COVID still it was still with us, um, and and uh, it's, it's difficult, you know, it, to to go back and, and revisit it again, you know, the, the same conclusion will probably be drawn with the same facts that are in front of the moderation team is all is all that I would say. Just to conclude on that, uh, Chair, I just wanted to make the point. I don't want to over egg the pressure on this one, to tell you the truth. I do respect the professionalism of those who have assessed this and the way they've gone about their business. Thank you, Chair. OK, uh, Councillor Elliott. Well, thanks, Chair. I just uh, wish you well in your year in the Chair. I am meant to declare an interest in this 7.1. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. No, I'll be very brief. Just it's really interesting to see the the number of different events and and really the number of angling and fishing events in in the Fermanagh region as well. Like the some of the smaller events, the the Kyahalbui Hedge School and the you know Puck and the Night of the Ghosts are very interesting. But the one that's really sparking the interest at the minute is the the Healy Park Summer Concert that's uh, in discussions for July of twenty twenty two. So. Um, obviously, if that's going to be a major event, maybe Councillor Green might wish to get involved in, in drawing a big name to that. But I think it's one to, to look forward to with, with much anticipation and, and hopefully we'll get uh, very much eased restrictions and, and a great event planned for, for next summer. Thank you, Chair. OK, well, we've had the recommendations proposed and seconded. Um, is everybody happy? OK. We'll move on to item 7.2, which is to consider the report on Inniskillen and Oma public space CCTV uh, effectiveness report. Over to John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in November of last year, it was approved that the Council would undertake a study into the effectiveness and impact of, of public safe space CCTV in, in Oma and Enniskillen. Um, the report is, is attached at Appendix 1, uh, which was undertaken by Insight Solutions uh, consultancy firm, and, and members themselves were part of that, that consultation process. Uh, the, the study has concluded that there is a strong consensus uh, among all of stakeholders for public space CCTV, uh, and the vast majority of stakeholders, in fact, would, would see it as a, a value in, in terms of public safety, in terms of security, um, anti Corbyn antisocial behaviour, and Corbyn crime, and so on. Um, however, there, there is no doubt that, that, that CCTV in, in both Oma and Enniskillen uh, requires significant investment um, in, in terms of infrastructure. Um, and I suppose that's the decision that has to be taken in the future. Uh, in, there is a need to determine the operational requirement uh, that, as a council, we have for CCTV, uh, which will determine that the the revenue and more importantly the equipment capital costs, which will be required in order for uh, maintenance and, and and monitoring. Um, there are also changes in in installation uh, with installation of full fibre. Uh, which will reduce the revenue costs moving ahead, and therefore it's an important uh, consideration in into the future uh, of CCTV. 
uh, based on on the information uh, that there is available there um, there is a question of affordability because uh, you know depending on on that statement of operational requirement uh, you know the cost of it can vary quite significantly depending on the level of of requirement that is that that is the council requires um, and and indeed the funding model by which CCTV is funded in the future um, the the need there is need for other partners to become involved in in, in funding if they require the CCTV uh, to 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 enhance their work um, the recommendations are are in, included in. in 2.8 of the report uh, and ultimately uh, culminate in, in the need for a full economic appraisal of, of CCTV for both OMA and Enniskillen and indeed taking account of the CCTV requirements uh, in our own council estate. Um, therefore, Chair, um, it's recommended that the council notes the report um, of, in Enniskillen's public space CCTV that's attached and uh, approves as the next step an economic appraisal to be undertaken to look at the investment options for future delivery of public space CCTV in, in Oman and Enniskillen and indeed to consider the funding, uh, the quality uh, of the cameras, the operation and the management of the system and indeed the operational requirements. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Thornton. Hey, thank you, Chair, and thank you, John, for this. Hey. I mean, CCTV, this is a minefield, and I'm sure John recognises that at this stage. Uh, with regard to operational requirements and something I've spoken to John about prior to the meeting, there's, there's no point in looking about camera selection or whatever. What, what we need to do is, we, we've established in this report that we do need CCTV in the towns, and, uh, but the, the question is, what do we need to see? and the level of image we require at each location, not in a general sense. So it is key that because of technology and the ever changing uh, camera systems and so on and so forth and model numbers, that operation requirements are required and those operation requirements should be council op operation requirements. The police who would probably look for a better system don't seem to be willing to pay to date for that better system, which would be more expensive. And I go into sort of the thrones of recognition, identify, and so on and so forth, which are stipulated under guidelines for it. So with regard to it, it's crucial that it's not a matter of, on their report on page 37, they say about camera quality. Camera quality has nothing to do with it. Uh, it's to do with image quality. And are we meeting the council requirements? If there's others want other requirements, they should be actually willing to put their hand in their pockets and pay for them. But we really have a responsibility for our repairs, not for evidential value in courts. So I am quite happy to support the recommendation as long as we are operating towards operation requirements rather than specifications or camera quality. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so you're proposing the two recommendations, uh, Councillor Thornton? I'm proposing the two recommendations as long as within the economic appraisal, we are writing operation requirements for each camera. Okay, Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I want to uh, thank John for his uh, very comprehensive report. And also to commend uh, Insight Solutions for what I think was a very, very good study uh, looking at the value and effectiveness of public space CCTV. Uh, I am a great supporter of public space CCTV, and I think in the modern age, uh, it is something that we absolutely need uh, to ensure uh, public safety and to uh, reduce the incidence of uh, antisocial behaviour and vandalism. Members will be aware uh, that we have had a, a number of incidents of vandalism. And whilst we cannot possibly cover uh, the entirety of the council estate with CCTV, I do think it is important, and John referenced this in his report, that uh, public space CCTV should also include uh, aspects of the council's estate. 
Um, I agree uh, in part with Councillor uh, Thornton's uh, comments. Um, I do think that if we go to the expense and trouble of uh, installing uh, state of the art uh, um, technology uh, using fibrous, uh, that uh, we should make it uh, to the uh, acceptable standard uh, for um, evidential requirements in court. Therefore, I think it is important that we should engage with a wide range of stakeholders, including the PSNI, uh, because I think that uh, this is important. And increasingly, the public uh, have an expectation uh, that CCTV uh, camera footage will be used for litigation purposes. And that's something which I support in the interests of uh, public safety. So I think that, um, you know, a full economic appraisal uh, with a wide range of stakeholders is required. Uh, it would uh, uh, not be possible for the council to fund this uh, in, in its totality. Uh, that would not be uh, something that I would support. It is important also that we discuss uh, uh, monitoring, uh, whether that be uh, uh, recorded footage or live monitoring. I would support live monitoring, but that obviously is more expensive. So uh, with those comments, Chair, I want to second uh, the, uh, this recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Coffey. Yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, this report uh, kind of... Uh, it doesn't exactly paint the great light of CCTV. Um, it's, it's, it suggests really that the CCTV we have in place is broadly unable to secure convictions and therefore um, maybe has an impact uh, in terms of putting people off. But um, the, the council is now obviously looking at trying to re renovate the entire CCTV, uh, particularly in OMA. And I, I totally agree with Councillor Thornton's position that uh, why are the police not covering the cost of this? This, If this is for them to enable conviction, uh, if we have to buy an entirely new system so that uh, it can actually uh, bring, bring be brought to court, uh, why is it, why is it that we're we're covering? Why is the ratepayers of our council area are covering this cost and not um, the the police service who are supposed to be providing a service and paid through uh, the central funds? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, according to this, the 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 uh, expenditure here, it's less than a hundred thousand pound a year. Now I know you may compound that up to infinity, but um, I'm just wondering why it is that uh, we're conducting a full economic appraisal on a project when the cost per year is one hundred thousand, and um, we just passed a motion, or sorry, we've passed a uh, uh, a plan or policy to increase the threshold for a full economic appraisals to £1 million. So I'm wondering whether, uh, is, it, uh, is it a case of economic appraisals when it's issues that matter to the, um, to, to, to the council, or is it, is it uh, economic appraisals when, you know, I, I, I just like some clarity on that. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yeah, Chair, just in relation to the economic appraisal, the, the, the cost of, uh, a new CCTV system in both OMA and Enniskillen, and I'm, I'm sure experts could could verify this is is really an open checkbook. Uh, you're not talking about one hundred thousand. You could be talking in the region of six seven figures of one million, depending on the type of 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 scheme that you go by. And therefore, in order to meet the threshold, in order to make sure that we have enough cover with regard to economic appraisals uh, for it, it is decided to go down the economic appraisal route. Okay, uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thanks, John, for the report. Uh, I'm happy enough to support the, the two recommendations as listed. I think what we're looking at here, and um, this is a has been good on for years, to be honest. Uh, we need to provide reassurance to all in our community, and that's including residents, the businesses, and visitors alike. Ideally, it should be done on a partnership approach, and I remember the uh, Department of Justice would have been involved way back with the, with the project, particularly in Oma, 
and uh, some of the comments that have been made by Councillor Thornton and, and Councillor Dehan are, are quite correct. But I think we have a way to go on this. And uh, item or the two recommendations, recommendation two is very, very important. And we'll, we'll have to get on with it as it is now. Thank you. Councillor Keenan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, I, I would sort of agree with uh, Councillor Thornton and Councillor Coffey that uh, you know, if these cameras are here for security issues or getting convictions, <clears throat> I'm not sure where the responsibility of the council lays. Uh, you know, if it's only a case of um, around council property or securing buildings, yes. But I think there's an inclination towards the big brother element cover every area with a CCTV camera, and that's it. You know, it's a massive cost to the, to the taxpayers or the ratepayers. And uh, yeah. You, you, you've got the peace and air security services, you know, as well as that, I've heard a lot of examples of uh, it being selective when someone does have an issue where they request CCTV, you know, so is it really open for the use of the public or, or is, it, is it just for convictions? And if it is, I think that should be the responsibility of the PSA. Thank you, Councillor Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, it was. Just a few things. I raised it at the uh, at, uh, meeting that we had in relation to, the, to this. And I see on uh, page 35 of the report, it says that uh, there's strong consensus among all stakeholders. Well, um, definitely there wasn't strong consensus where I was concerned. Um, what we're talking about, and it's getting the NOMA here, uh, I think John talked about almost uh, uh, up on a million. Now, uh, in the rural proof, and where it says uh, this has been rural proof, it says there, is, there are no negative rural proofing implications. Well, there's probably no negative uh, uh, implications apart from that everyone else in the council area is paying uh, up on a million pound for Alice Gill and Oma to have CCDB. Uh, what about... Um, Businesses in Listenski and Irvingstown and every other uh, area uh, that uh, there has to pay uh, pay for their own CCTV or uh, just get on with it. Uh, I think it's that rare just to be talking about up to, up on a million pound and that there's no negative rural proofing implications on this. Uh, I I just don't get it because on the day when this was being talked about, that was the 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 theme uh, over and over again that it's basically when I asked the question, I don't think there had been one conviction uh, with these cameras. Now, uh, if we are talking about paying up to someone mentioned there, um, the rate here. Well, no harm. I'm living up here in Cunha and I don't get one single benefit from a camera in the Midland of Skill and Town or a home town. Now, there might be absolutely valid reasons for having them there. Absolutely. And I definitely think the police should be uh, paying for them if uh, if they think that uh, there's a safety issue and that all there. I don't think it's the council's responsibility. But to say that there was a, a, a general consensus or there was a large consensus on this, uh, I, I suspect if they went out and asked the people in our area, would they be uh, prepared to pay up the million pound to have a few cameras in the uh, end of scale in Oma? I suspect that the, the answer would be uh, no way. But that's my top one's worth anyway. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Coffey. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in relation to Councillor Green's a uh, few comments I suppose the, the, the general consensus and, and there was a generally co strong consensus of the need for it uh, both from a from a, the visitor economy uh, and indeed the financial economy and, and you know we, we have our, our purple flag and it's one of the most important things in in the in the purple flag that invites people into our into our <laughs> towns 
in uh, during the nighttime economy. Um, so that there are there are particular reasons, you know, of why uh, Oman and Askelin as, as to why you would have a uh, CCTV and that that is brought out in in relation to the cost. You know, I suppose the reason for the economic appraisal would be to determine what the exact cost based on that operational requirement that uh, Councillor Thornton has uh, has indicated. Okay, uh, the next we have up Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, um, the, the story that, that jumps out at me in terms of the, the CTTV is uh, a person I know, an individual I know, had their car hit at the car park uh, beside the bus station in Oma. CCTV camera facing directly at it, thinking, oh, great, this will capture the culprit who had drove off and left that. After quite a struggle to find out, first of all, who owned the camera or where you could retrieve the information from, and finally getting through to speak to someone, found out that they didn't actually record the the video. So, and at the end, whilst they thought they thought they were parked in a fairly safe spot, it it offered absolutely no reassurance and and no uh, comeback to them. Councillor Green's quite right when he says that he raised the issue of questioning how many. Uh, convictions or many charges has led to, and I think he he wasn't met with a response that was very positive. The noting of the report is is quite concerning. That even page five there, note note seven states that the current CCTV infra infrastructure in Oma is obsolete. The quality of images per equipment out of date, and all cameras uh, require replacement. The the other concern that's highlighted the page before that is. Uh, and relating to invasion of privacy, non-consensual data collection and profiling. And I suppose people in my neck of the woods are, are very aware of that, given the surveillance cameras that were put up there recently. But I think the points that have been raised by a number of members that if this is primarily a law and order issue, uh, why isn't it the relevant authorities, be that the PSNI or Justice Department, that, are, that they aren't meeting the bill for this? Because, you know, if they can... If the PSNI can, example, ignore a, a bill that already knows them, which is probably well in excess of a million pounds, there there are finances available there from other sources rather than the rate pair. So uh, I would echo the sentiments of a number of previous speakers, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Feely. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, for letting me in. I'd, I'd like to agree with a lot of stuff that Chairman said there. No, sorry, Victor, I'm coming in this, uh, and I know. I'm not telling you what to do or trying to think about it. As I said earlier on, you're a very capable chair of the meeting, but I, I don't think you're going to get the meeting finished this evening. And I was just hoping that you could skip on and, and go to 10.7. This letter came in very late from Brandon. I think it's quite important that we discuss it because there's a meeting tomorrow and just to see what the what the view of the members is. I know we got the, meet, the, the letter late. I only seen it myself, but I have been chatting people down here about it. So it's just one that could you give me a little bit of it and we discuss that. Thank you, Victor. Okay. Uh, right. Well, we've had the yeah. pr the proposal. We've had the proposal on the CCTV. Uh, the recommendations proposed and seconded. Uh, everybody happy with those? No, chair. Uh, okay. With the exception. Nope. Of Councillor McAleer, not sorry, Councillor O'Coffey and Councillor Keenan. Chair, you can add my name to that as well. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor McAleer. Okay, bear with me a second. Okay, um, taking some advice uh, from officers. Um, unfortunately, there is not a mission 
that we are going to get this meeting finished within a half an hour even because there's a lot more stuff uh, obviously to go through as you can see from the agenda and I can't uh, extend the minute uh, meeting by a half an hour if we don't think we can get it finished so uh, I'm sorry for those who uh, on the CCMS thing uh, but I'm going to have to now bring the meeting to a close. Can, um, can I propose we cancel the meeting with CCMS tomorrow Victor? Can I just propose that point that we cancel the meeting with CCMS tomorrow? I'll second it. I just want to go with the wishes of the community affected down here. And it, well, I'm glad, I'm very glad to hear you've changed your mind on that, Anthony. And I did ask Victor. Please, please, everybody, chair. through the chair, please, yeah, through, the chair. through the chair. I had sent it in a private I chat. I know, and I'd seen it, and that's why, yes, uh, um, through, through the chair, please, and hold on a minute. It is, it is crucial for tomorrow, and uh, the meeting shouldn't proceed with the, uh, given the express wishes of the no. Parents' Council. Yeah. And, uh, and and indeed, yeah. CCMS shouldn't be dictating who our no. council and our local no, authority no. invite uh, to our meetings. Like, right, it, please, it makes please. no oh. sense whatsoever. Right. And another thing as well, Victor, I suppose we would have had plenty of time. A lot of speakers here tonight talk for far more than three minutes. Uh, and, I, uh, and the, Brawla, the Brawla situation is so crucial. Our rural services, the rural school, the way they have been treated by CCMS has been abysmal. It's the elected members to this local authority who invited CCMS, of which they don't get to dictate the terms. So that's why the Parents' Council have asked I, I appreciate does not go ahead without appreciate, them being represented. I appreciate what you are saying now. Please, no more speakers in this, please. Uh, I'm going to bring in the Chief Executive for a comment here. Okay, Chair, it's really just in, in terms of the request before you. So members will recall at the Council meeting on Wednesday evening, uh, the update from CCMS was provided and members agreed to proceed, albeit reluctantly, with the meeting tomorrow. That is now a council position, and the only mechanism by which that meeting cannot proceed is if the, there is a call in of the decision. So, um, there is no if there is a proposal this evening that it doesn't proceed, I'm afraid that will not rescind the decision that the council took last week. Uh, but what I would say, Chair, is that in your discussions last week, you also there was a separate proposal that we write again to CCMS advising that there should be a further meeting with the council and representatives of the parents council as well so just to clarify on that on that side chair okay find the other chair find the other uh, just uh, just to clarify that uh, surely we could uh, have a rescind motion tonight to rescind that it needs to be boycotted chair a rescinding motion would have to be presented in writing and considered I thought those two types of rescinding motion, uh, uh, Alison, maybe I'm wrong. And Alison, just to clarify as well. Through the know, chair, please, Councillor oh, yeah. Swift. Yeah, I have my hand. Can you not see no, that? No, your right? hand's not up. Oh, well, it's up on the side. <laughs> well, anyway, apologies for that. Um, Alison, the fact that uh, I had called the meeting and had asked that CCMS uh, be invited to speak with the parents council because this is specifically to do with the peace project that our council is involved with ccms don't get to say who gets invited so we the council are inviting the parents council to the meeting and if it can't go up proceed like that then members should respectfully boycott any attendance tomorrow that would be against the wishes of the people of the Brawler area. It's just totally unfair. It's totally uh, out out of the big bounds of what we should be representing. And here, here. it gets to dictate um, to us who can and cannot be invited. This is a flagrant breach of human rights and um, exclusion. Tomorrow, from an Anoma District Council are signing pledges about everybody belongs. We are not going to be discriminating against our very own citizens and our very own ratepayers. They are the important people in this situation. Gormaga, Kirla. Right, I'm going to... Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. 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 I'm going to have, I'm going to, have to bring the meeting to a close. The time is gone. Um, the Chief Executive has made uh, it clear 
what you want to do tomorrow, uh, whether you just want to boycott the meeting or whether you just want to attend it, that's entirely up to yourselves. Uh, but we can't go into any more discussion on this tonight. We're out of time and we it is no longer uh, possible to discuss anything more. Uh, I'm sorry. I know it's a very passionate uh, uh, thing in your area and I appreciate that. I've been involved with school closures myself in the past and I know how you're feeling. So, but we'll, you know, as I say, whatever you want to do tomorrow, that's entirely up to yourself, but the meeting uh, will at this stage uh, be going ahead. So, um, boycott it thank you. Oh, Sorry, stop coming in over the top yeah. of the chair, please. Um, so that is the meeting to an end. Thank you very much uh, for taking part. There was a lot of business which we didn't get through. We will be looking to see what we're going to do in that case, and we will be informing you uh, shortly of what's going forward. Thank you. Chair, can I ask if we have an indicative okay. date for a, a reconvened meeting of tonight's committee? No, not at this time. Fair enough. Thank you.